federal election. It comes just less than two years into what has been a minority parliament unlike any other during an unprecedented time. For the past two years, Canadian politics has been anything but quiet. A global pandemic, multiple political scandals, an Indigenous reckoning, record spending and deficits, and a national vaccine program. As the country opens up, the impact of what we've all been through, what we've all witnessed, is still top of mind. No wonder Canadians are anxious about their future, their families, their jobs, their health, their homes, their communities, their country, their climate, their world. Now it's time to decide what to do about it. It's election time and it starts right now. As the leaders go from coast to coast to coast to convince Canadians that their vision is the right vision, to guide us out of the COVID-19 pandemic, to tackle our biggest challenges, to chart a course for the future. Trudeau, O'Toole, Blanchette, Singh, Paul. The choice is yours. This is your decision. This is your vote. This is Canada Vote. Hello, everyone. I'm Rosemary Barton. It is a fairly glorious summer day here in Ottawa. If you were going to call an election, this is the kind of day you would want to see, and it's going to be a busy one here as well. Here's what we already know. This will be uh, day one of what is expected to be a 36-day campaign. That would put Election Day, the day you make your decision, voting day, on Monday, September 20th. It will also be the shortest campaign under Elections Canada rules. This is the very minimum that you have to have in order to have a campaign. Justin Trudeau is expected to uh, come down from his home, Rideau Cottage, which is just behind the building that you see there, Rideau Hall, to speak with the new Governor General, Mary Simon, and ask her officially to dissolve Parliament. He will then come here in front of the door there to the podium to deliver remarks, uh, take questions, the official kickoff to Campaign 44. But first, let's give you a reminder of where we left off. Here's what the makeup of seats in the House of Commons looked like when the House rose in June. The Liberals, with a strong minority, have 155 seats. The Conservatives are the official opposition, with 119. The Bloc has 32 seats, the NDP trails in fourth with 24. And the Greens, who started the session with three seats, is down to two because of that defection to the Liberals and a handful of independents. But all that gets wiped out as of now. All 338 seats start from scratch as the leaders begin to vie for your vote on Election Day. In the next hour, we will hear from Liberal leader Justin Trudeau as he kicks off the campaign. We'll also hear from all the other party leaders. And over the next five or so weeks, we'll see some new faces who will make their bid to be part of Canada's 44th parliament, some in key races with incumbents from coast to coast to coast. All of this assuming, of course, that the Governor General says yes to the Prime Minister. You can have your election. It would be highly unlikely that she would refuse it, but it's always possible. Uh, we've got lots of help on the ground to kick off election 44. Ashley Burke, Hannah Thibodeau, Olivia Stefanovic, David Thurton, and Rafi Bujakanyan covering the Bloc Québécois. He will join us shortly. We'll hear from all of them, as well as the leaders they are covering, as the morning unfolds. These are sort of the critical first moments of the election, where each leader gets a chance to start framing what they think this election will be about. Ashley Burke is here at Rideau Hall. She'll be covering the Liberals uh, for this first week. We are waiting for the Prime Minister to arrive. But after his chat with Mary Simon, he'll be kicking off his campaign as the Liberal leader still the Prime Minister, but we'll call him the Liberal leader during that time uh, once that happens. And Ashley, what, what are you hearing about these first hours for uh, Justin Trudeau? Well, he's going to be facing some questions from journalists today about why he's calling it triggering an election during an unpredictable variant driven fourth wave and as well at a time when uh, the government's going to be going into caretaker mode when there are thousands of Afghans in Afghanistan as it's falling right now who the government has promised to resettle some who are scared for their lives. I'm getting texts this morning from them saying that they are concerned they will not get back here to Canada. And we've I've got some intel on the speech we're expecting from the prime minister today 
It's uh, going to address the Afghan situation. And as well, uh, really, there's going to be another push for vaccines, we're told. We heard an announcement on Friday that's going to be underscored today that all federal workers have to be fully vaccinated, as well as anyone traveling who wants to travel on a plane or a train or even step on board a cruise ship. They need to be fully vaccinated. That's something that the Liberals feel plays well for them. There's a lot of Canadians that want to see that tough stance, but also it's a way to draw a stark contrast between the uh, the Conservatives and uh, the Conservative leader Aaron O'Toole. We saw him come out on Friday with a reaction to that. The speech today also is expecting to touch on um, that uh, raising a tax on the 1% to help the middle class, a price on pollution, and really this messaging we're expecting to hear today from Trudeau during his speech is that he has kept Canadians safe and now it's time to hear from Canadians themselves and uh, start to hear from them about how to chat, chart a path forward out of this pandemic. Okay, Ashley, and, and you're right, that, fir that first critical question to Justin Trudeau, why now, uh, will, will be the one that he has to have a good answer for for Canadians who are in the middle of their, their summer holidays, if they have them. Ashley Burke here at Rideau Hall with us. Thanks, Ashley. We'll get back to you through the morning. We want to take a minute, uh, a literal minute, to give you a quick election primer on the Liberal leader. We'll do that for all the leaders. Here's Justin Trudeau in 60 seconds. It's been a long two years for Liberal leader Justin Trudeau, but a slowing pandemic has given cause for optimism. Even a return to normal, though, won't be enough to silence his critics. The pandemic has been expensive for Canadians. Record spending means record deficits. And then there are the scandals, a third ethics investigation, the handling of sexual misconduct allegations in the armed forces, and the resignation of his pick for governor general after damning workplace accusations. But this election, Trudeau will look to set the path going forward. This is what Building Back Better is all about, working together to build a cleaner and more prosperous future. With promises of a greener economy, childcare, and a plan to tackle climate change. So if Trudeau hopes to propel his party to a new majority, he'll have to convince Canadians he managed COVID and that his post-pandemic vision is the right one for the future. So that is what the Liberal leader, the Prime Minister, is looking for in the days ahead. Hannah Thibodeau, though, is with the leader of the official opposition, the Conservative leader, Aaron O'Toole, at the Conservative headquarters. That's in downtown Ottawa. Hannah, give us a sense of what it's there right now, what, it, what it's like there right now and, and what we can expect from the Conservative campaign on day one. Yeah, absolutely. Well, expect to see a lot of this virtual studio for the Conservative campaign. They plan on being in this studio about two to three times a week. Uh, one of the things you're going to hear from Conservative leader Aaron O'Toole is that exact question that you mentioned, Rosie. Why an election now in as we're heading into this fourth wave? So they want to be cautious about how they handle their campaign in the midst of a fourth wave. So a little less traveling for the Conservative leader, but doesn't mean a lot less work. They will hold virtual uh, conversations with Canadians across this country, but also they want to present themselves as the party that is will be more fiscally responsible and ready to recover from this pandemic than the Liberals. Expect to hear that today. But also, uh, coming back to that question as to why an election campaign now, that is going to be the theme, I would say, for at least a couple of days in this campaign, unless the Prime Minister has a very good answer for this. As we saw coming into this weekend, there was a meme video on social media saying by the Conservatives that it's simply because he wants a majority and no other reason why. So we'll wait to see what the Conservative leader has to say, but we will be in this location quite frequently and they do want to present themselves as the ones that can handle this fiscal recovery much better than a Liberal Party would be able to, especially when people want to go back to school, get their kids back to school safely and as we head into this fourth wave. Okay, Hannah Thibodeau, and I know Aaron O'Toole has been practicing, practicing, well, he's been having real town halls there in that location, that virtual location. So he's got a handle on, on how it works at this stage, uh, and that's where he's going to spend his, his first day. A, a very unlikely way to start a campaign, but this is not going to be a traditional campaign. Hannah, thanks for that. We'll check back with you. Uh, as I said, we're going to take a look at everybody in 60 seconds. Here's Aaron O'Toole. Conservative leader Aaron O'Toole is looking for a reversal of fortune, 
O'Toole has struggled to expand his party's big blue tent since becoming leader last August, and there is serious ground to make up. His personal polling numbers are troubling for the party. Some of his own supporters have criticized his plan to tackle climate change, including putting a price on carbon, a move seen by others as critical to securing Canadians' votes. Canada has changed. Our party has to change too. He's been criticized for adopting so-called progressive policies while trying to appeal to the social conservatives inside his own party. But O'Toole is not one to back down from a fight. He has already unveiled his five-point economic recovery plan. It promises that conservatives will secure jobs, increase accountability, focus on mental health, the country and the economy. He hopes to get Canadians on board with his vision, but to do that, he will have to attract new supporters and keep the ones he has. All right, so that is Aaron O'Toole and some of the challenges that he will be facing over the coming weeks. David Cochran will be jumping on one of those campaigns soon enough. He's actually going to join uh, the Liberal Party uh, after he spends some time here with me at Rideau <laughs> Hall, because we're both going to be pretty busy over the next few weeks. Let's start with that, um, that question. I think that that will be the first question to the Prime Minister, one that I would imagine he is prepared for, and that is why now? Fr from what people are telling you, what, what is the sense of how they make that case then to Canadians? Well, I mean, look, strategically, why now? It's because they have the widest path to the most seats and, and, and a decent path to a majority. Not a clear-cut one. It's going to take. It gets narrow as you get to the 170 seats, but they think they've got a shot at that. Uh, they they have been talking about the dysfunctional nature of Parliament yes. for weeks and months now. That can't be the answer. Uh, because you know what's been dysfunctional for the past year and a half? The world. You know, everything has been dysfunctional because of COVID. So he needs a better answer than that. Why he's seeking a third mandate during a fourth wave and going to the polls in a pandemic. So the central argument we're going to hear a lot today, I think, from the Liberals and, and from the Prime Minister is that, look, we had your back during the pandemic. You can count on us to build back better along the values that align with the broad majority of yep. Canadians. The challenge here is Hannah, when everyone was talking about, is the anxiety about this fourth wave. We're seeing cases go up in the four biggest provinces, which are the four most important provinces politically, and school is going to be reopening soon and people are worried about that. And Rosie, while we're on the air, the, the, the government has just announced that they've temporarily suspended operations at the Embassy of Canada in Afghanistan. So you have a situation there where Kabul is falling, the country is going down, thousands of people the government has promised to help are still there and they're still stuck there. And this reminds me of 2015, where the Syrian refugee yes. issue became yes. such a big political issue for Stephen Harper, when Alan Kurdi, yeah. the little boy, washed up on that beach, how it changed the complexion of the election. We don't know what's going to happen in Afghanistan. We can assume it's not going to be good. And right now, Mark Garneau, the Foreign Affairs Minister, and Marco Mendicino, the Immigration Minister, they're putting their departments into caretaker mode, and they're going to be on the campaign trail yeah. while this diplomatic and humanitarian crisis is unfolding. Yeah. So that's uh, that's going to be a challenge for them on the campaign trail. It is undoubtedly too while they, why they you know scrambled to make that announcement at the end of the week that they would bring in twenty thousand refugees from Afghanistan. Uh, you're quite right, not unlike what they did in with the Syrian crisis, where they were the first party out of the gate to say we're going to bring in refugees here again. They said that they would do that, uh, but David's right that that announcement just happening now from a foreign affairs minister before he. Uh, goes into caretaker mode that we are suspending our diplomatic relations um, at the Embassy of Canada to Afghanistan. In case you weren't paying attention to the news this morning, Kabul is essentially uh, surrounded and has been overtaken by the Taliban, who is looking to enter into negotiations uh, with the government there in terms of how that handover takes place. But the Taliban has taken back large portions of Afghan at this, sta at this stage and undone much of the work that was uh, put in place by um, Canadian forces and, and other uh, allied forces to try and secure democracy and, and the safety and security of Afghans. So that will become a storyline throughout this election, of course. But the first one will be why this election is happening now and how Canadians feel about it. This election is about your vote, after all, and uh, what you want to know and hear from the leaders. We have connected already with some voters across this country about what matters to them. Here's what one had to say. My name is Dodie Ferguson. I'm from Cowes' First Nation, which is in Treaty 4 territory. And I also live in Regina. I am a wife, I'm a mother, I'm a grandmother. The biggest um, thing for me in this, in this upcoming federal election is how this federal government will attend to uh, the calls to action and the calls to justice in the Truth and Reconciliation and the um, Royal Report for the Murdered and Missing Indigenous Women and Girls and Two-Spirited People.
There is a long road ahead for Canada, and I think that there is a lot of truth that needs to be discussed, unpacked, that we need to heal from as a country and as people before we can even talk about how can we reconcile or, as I say, as, as an Indigenous woman, how can my children reclaim who they are? because broken promises are a legacy for Indigenous people. And I think uh, going forward, generations are going to demand more, and I look forward to that myself. So reconciliation, certainly something that is top of mind for, for many Canadians, perhaps in a way that it hasn't been uh, in previous elections, uh, in light of some of the discoveries of unmarked graves uh, in various First Nations communities. Again, the government there uh, worked hard at the end, at the uh, last couple of weeks, where it's been making a, a flurry of announcements to uh, secure funding for uh, more discovery and for supporting mental health for people throughout that. But uh, again, we do expect that that issue will be top of mind for many Canadians uh, throughout this election. But as David talked about here, part of this is also about political opportunity. Where do the parties stand? Let's check in with the CBC News contributor, the Ritz, Eric Grenier. He's still running our poll tracker for us and will continue to do that throughout the election. Eric, always nice to see you. Um, give, us a, give us a sense of where things stand. Of course, we all know that, that things are going to change dramatically, perhaps even over the next uh, five or six weeks here, but, but where things are right now. Yeah, we're going to be following the polls throughout the campaign, and they will change, but let's take a look at where they are on day one, the national numbers in our poll tracker, which is an aggregation of all the polls that are published in Canada. And the Liberals do have an advantage. They have a big advantage right now. They're at about 36% support in the polls. They had 33% in the last election, so they are doing better than in 2019. Who's not doing better? The Conservatives. They're down to just under 29%. Traditionally, the floor for the Conservatives has been 30%, but we've been seeing that their numbers have dipped below that number. The New Democrats, they're doing pretty well. They're right now at 19% support. They had 16% in the last election, so their numbers have been improving. Bloc Québécois still at 7%. They're at about, uh, they're in second place in Quebec. The Greens are down to 5%. We've seen their polls really dip over the last few months. And look at that other number, 5% right now. A lot of that is Maxim Bernier's People's Party. But of course, elections in Canada are not decided by the number of votes, by the number of seats. So let's take a look at where we expect these kinds of national numbers would uh, produce in the House of Commons. What kind of seat count you would have for each of the parties. And uh, right now, what we're expecting with these kinds of numbers, and again, they will change between now and Election Day, the Liberals are just at the threshold of 170 seats needed for a majority government. You can see that they are ranging both below and above that 170 seat line. So a majority is certainly in play for them, but they could come up short. The Conservatives right now, they're pulling at a place that should give them about 100 seats. So that would be a drop of 21 from the last election. The New Democrats, they're right now doing pretty well. They could pick up maybe 12 seats, get about 36, maybe move ahead of the Bloc Québécois in the House uh, of Commons. They are in a good position to win the 30 or so seats that they won in the last election, and the Greens could have a couple losses. But right now, it's all about whether the Liberals can get above that 170-seat mark and stay there between now and Election Day. And it's worth reminding people, Eric, that um, the Conservatives picked up seats in the last election. I think they picked up 22 seats compared to 2015 and still were not able to form government. So th this is also about, like, where the support is, right? And for the Conservatives, it is sometimes too concentrated in, in small parts of the country, and then it becomes difficult for them to have enough seats to form government. Yeah, absolutely. The Conservatives are only really leading right now in Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and Alberta. And even there, we're starting to see that these other parties, the Maverick Party, the People's Party, is eating into that Conservative support. So for the Liberals, uh, a lead that they have right now in the polls nationally is not that big. Traditionally, it hasn't been enough to give them a majority government. But because of how efficient their vote is across the country, they could eke by with a majority government, even though they're under that 36% mark. And just one last question about the NDP, because they could be the game changer here in terms of if they get enough support, they start to split things for the Liberals, and then it becomes harder for the Liberals to form any kind of government at all. Yeah, right now the party with momentum would be the NDP, not the Conservatives. So if you're Justin Trudeau wondering about who's going to stand in your way to get that majority government, you'd look at the New Democrats and also the Bloc Québécois in Quebec. Uh, you can't rule them out either. Okay, Eric Grenier, so glad you're with us. I miss you so. Uh, but you can, uh, Eric's looking after the poll tracker through the election. He'll be with us on TV and radio. And you can check out, of course, his, uh, his newsletter. It's called The Writ, if you want to have a look at that. Eric, we'll talk to you later. Thank you, friend. Thanks.
All right, I'll bring back uh, I'll bring back David Cochran. Let, let's talk a little bit about those numbers because I know you've been having lots of conversations with yeah. people about where opportunity um, lies. And again, I remind people we're just giving you the picture as things stand. We we know that campaigns do matter, things do change. But right now, the, the Liberals do see a path to, as you say, a majority, but a, but a small one. Yeah, and that path to a majority government for the Liberals really goes through the suburbs of Canada's three largest cities. They're in a battle with the Bloc Québécois for for the suburban ridings around the island of Montreal that the Bloc took from the Liberals in the last election, denying them the 40 seats they were really counting on getting in Quebec that probably would have gotten them really close to a majority. There's there's the GTA, the 416, and, and then spreading out into the, the larger, uh, medium-sized urban centres uh, throughout Ontario, particularly in Hamilton, Windsor, London, Kitchener, that sort of area. And then there's the lower mainland of British Columbia. You're going to see the Prime Minister, the, soon to be called the Liberal leader by us, uh, in those areas constantly. Because if you look at Atlantic Canada, they have 27 seats. The expectation is they'll do status quo, maybe a little bit better there. They're at 35 in Quebec. They need to hold that or grow. They need to gain in Ontario. That's where they've got the most incumbents. That's where they've got the best ground game. And, and that's where they think they can overperform uh, because of the, the, the difficulties with the Conservative brand, because of frustration with Doug Ford as the yep. Premier and also there. And they even see some opportunity to pick up in the prairies, because yeah. uh, this is one of the challenges for Aaron O'Toole right now, Rosie, is his vote is very concentrated, the support is very concentrated in those prairie provinces. But even the conservatives you talk to tell you, yeah, we're in trouble in four, five, six seats in Alberta. You know, there's a couple in Saskatchewan, you know, in Saskatoon for the NDP in the north with the Liberals. And, and then they have a, some incumbents not running in places like on, in, in, in the smaller centers in Ontario, uh -huh. which the Liberals have targeted for gain. So there, there, there's a lot of dynamics there, plus the blue-orange fights in southwestern Ontario, in Windsor, and in northern Ontario, where the New Democrats will be coming after the conservatives. Justin Trudeau's the front runner here. He is the sitting prime minister. But Aaron O'Toole has a lot of battles on a lot on the left and the right that he has to yeah. fight in this election that, that is going to make this quite the challenge for him to grow from where they are yeah. right now. And it is his first election as a, as a federal leader. Of course, he you know successfully held a leadership race during a pandemic and managed to become the leader of the Conservative Party, but this is his first chance uh, to show his stuff and show what he's got uh, for the country. Um, okay, um, I, I'll just remind people too, David talked about incumbents and, and people um, perhaps not running again. There are at least 29 MPs who won't be running again. Mm -hmm. Some big names, both on the Liberal side and the Conservative side. Um, but, you know, those people will be replaced and, and they will move on. But when you have an incumbent, uh, it is, of course, more likely that you're able to keep the seat because they have a tradition of uh, moving forward. I'll just ask where we're going next here. Okay. Okay. Okay, and we're just standing by for uh, Justin Trudeau to, to come here, to where I am, to Rideau Hall. Remember, he's actually living in Rideau Cottage, a place we all became very familiar with uh, during the pandemic. It's just around the corner, literally behind um, Rideau Hall. So he'll make his way to visit Mary Simon, the new governor general. This isn't her first official uh, act as governor general, but she will uh, she will take Justin Trudeau's meeting and we'll see how long they're in there and they will decide indeed whether we are about to kick off um, the election campaign. We've been giving you a brief look at all the leaders and some of the risks and challenges they are facing throughout um, this next campaign, the next 36 days. I'll show you now Jagmeet Singh in 60 seconds. Thank you, everybody. Jagmeet Singh is about to take on his second election as NDP leader. After nearly four years, Singh is hoping to hit his stride, but that's easier said than done. The last election was one supporters will likely want to forget. The NDP lost nearly half their seats and fell to fourth place. In order to gain back ground this time, they will have to target known regions of support. Expect the NDP to double down on a national pharmacare program, paid sick leave, higher minimum wage, and what Singh calls a climate emergency. And to push the message that it was the NDP who managed to convince the government to improve some of its pandemic response. When new Democrats are elected, we actually fight and get the help delivered. The NDP is also focusing on the youth vote, 18 to 40 year olds, pushing message through social and digital media, including TikTok. A challenge there to make sure those voters show up at the polls. Improving his fortunes this time round will be the NDP's measure of success.
All right, so that is a look at some of what uh, lies ahead for Jagmeet Singh, not his first federal election campaign, but one where he has to do better than he did in the last campaign. Olivia Stefanovic will be traveling with the NDP leader on this first week. Olivia, what can we expect? I believe you're in Montreal already. Yes, that's right, Rosie. We're in the riding of Laurier St. Marie. It's currently held by Liberal MP Stephen Guibault. And this is a riding, Rosie, where the NDP hopes they can take support away from the Liberals. We're waiting for NDP leader Jagmeet Singh to arrive. He's expected to speak after we hear from Justin Trudeau. And Singh's expected to come out of, of, of the gate right away, trying to distinguish himself from the other federal leaders as someone who not only says the right thing, but will actually follow through and deliver. And, you know, this time, Rosie, compared to the last election, he's actually running on a track record because before he was fairly a, a newcomer to the rest of Canada. He was an Ontario politician, a lawyer there. But since then, he's really grown as a leader. He has a likability factor. He's seen as someone who's really authentic. And he's running on this track record that he convinced, the, the, the NDP convinced the Liberal government to increase supports for things like the CERB, the wage subsidy, and paid sick leave. And it's these successes that the NDP point to uh, as the reasons why Canadians have the supports that they do because of their advocacy. So we expect that, that uh, Singh to continue talking about these things and using this as the argument for why more new Democrats need to be elected. But at the same time, Rosie, we expect to hear from Singh that this is not a time to call an election. We expect Singh to say that this is a, a selfish summer election, but that if there is one, the Liberals should not get a majority. Okay, Olivia Stefanovic, already on the Hastings in Montreal uh, with the NDP. Thanks, Olivia. We will come back to you through this special. We've already had our first crisis here on the set. All the lights, camera, teleprompter, monitors, all went down. So I'm ready. I'm ready for the next 36 days here. But you didn't even know it. You didn't even know it. We just kept going. Um, I'm going to bring in, uh, bring back David uh, Cochran and, and my friend and podcast co-host Elamin Abdul Mahmoud. He's my uh, co-host on our podcast Party Lines, which is also about politics uh, and he's gotten up early for us on this Sunday morning too to join us here. Um, Elamine, because I've already let David talk twice, I'll start with you. Uh, what, you know, a lot of people will be asking that question about why an election uh, right now. What, what do you what do you think is the challenge with that with that answer for for the government at this point and for the prime minister? I mean, first of all, Rosie, I got to say, we got to stop meeting like this. This has got to be the, you know, it's, this can't be the reason we keep doing this. Um, but let I me know. tell you. Uh, I know, we basically I, I, vacation together at this point. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yes, exactly. Okay, so the, the thing that I'm thinking about is that it's going to be really important for the prime minister to change that story probably on the first day because all everybody's going to be asking is, why do we need this election? And usually, um, that is a story that I think we talk about for three or four days. And then eventually, people get bored of it and say, okay, but there's an election, what are the issues at stake? But right now, um, we are dealing with a fourth wave that is on the horizon. So that question becomes a little bit more pertinent. It has legs. It could stay around for a little bit longer. And so I'm looking to see like what the prime minister says to pivot that conversation, to make it about, oh, here's what we're going to do for the country, as opposed to, I just really need a majority, because of course, that's not a good enough reason to do any of this. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it does feel already, uh, David, I'll get you to weigh in here, as though the, the pivot will be partially about vaccinations. And, and we already know that there's significant differences between how the campaigns are approaching that. Uh, the Liberals are making it mandatory for their candidates. The Conservatives are uh, highly recommending it, for instance. Um, and, and I think the other point will probably be, uh, David, I'll get you to weigh in here, that, that yes, we're in a fourth wave, but we also have a huge amount of the population that is vaccinated. So we are in a different place than we were uh, you know, if, if we had contemplated this a, a number of months ago, I, I would imagine that would be part of his answer here. Yeah, and you can, you can look at the, the, the difference in the numbers. You see the graphs of how the U.S. is dealing with Delta yeah. versus how we're dealing with Delta. We're in a gr better situation compared to the United States, but it doesn't mean it's a great situation overall. Uh, the argument I've been hearing from liberals over the last couple of weeks is that we're moving from pandemic to epidemic. Right, yeah. and, and this is essentially because there's all these clips and the, the Conservatives have rather smartly put together a montage of the greatest hits of the, the Prime Minister saying, we don't want an election, we don't want an election, we don't want an election, as he gets ready to call an election. Uh, but the <laughs> argument will be we've moved to epidemic. Whether that lands, I don't know. Um, I've, I've felt, and, and, and this is what I, I've asked a lot of people about is, 
you know, a lot of us were just getting vacations. A lot of us were just getting life back to normal. We're able to go to a Costco without feeling like we're going over the top in World War I, you know, with that level of stress. Our kids are going to go back to school for in-class learning, and now this gets dropped on top of them. Uh, you can understand how it's in the Liberals' interest to go now with a lead in the polls. They went into the last election tied and, and came out with a minority. So you can see how it's in their interest. They need to explain how it's in everybody else's yeah. interest, and they're going to have everybody sniping at them on that point from the sidelines. So they better have a good answer starting today. Yeah, and, and I think we're all, we all agree that that'll probably be the story for the first days. It probably won't be the story by the end of things. But even if, uh, even if the campaign becomes about let's like let's just touch wood becomes about actual issues <laughs> and policy um <laughs> and you never know it sometimes doesn't but if it becomes about that that i i think then the liberals are happy and the conservatives are happy because there's a really uh well everybody would would put what they want in the window but there becomes then a game of uh, or a presentation of contrast in terms of what the country looks like after a pandemic and 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 there are different different visions there, Elamine, and, and that will be something that Canadians will have to think about, too, eventually. I'm just, I'm just not entirely confident that that is the election that we're headed towards right now. I mean, like, we saw a sort yeah. of pre-writ wedge, um, which is that story about um, mandating vaccines for air travel, for train travel. Um, and right away, you saw a conservative response that was taking a different side. And you could sort of see the, the, the sort of storm clouds gathering around this topic. Is that, is this going to be an election about what the post-COVID economy looks like? Or is this going to be an election about, hey, these guys are more hesitant about the vaccines than we are, and we're willing to mandate them? Because one is actually uglier, I think. Like, one of those, one of those elections is okay. uglier, and, like, the hope is that we get to those meaningful topics as a opposed to um, just finding wedges wherever we go, because wedges are effective, but I'm not sure that they make for the most, um, I don't know, like compelling or meaningful elections. No, I, I would totally agree with you, David. Yeah, and, and that's the issue that the Liberals really want this campaign to be about. Right? I was talking to a Conservative yeah. about this uh, over the last 24 hours, that the position O'Toole is in is that we encourage it, but it's a personal choice. One, that's not the position they're taking on their campaign. You want to go on his plane, you want to go on his bus, it's a mandated vaccination for you and the political staff. So it's a different standard on the Conservative campaign itself. But that's also this personal responsibility approach Jason Kenney and Doug Ford have tried to strike, and they have the lowest approval ratings of any premier for their handling of the pandemic, not making the right happy, not making yeah. the left happy, and just sort of getting gobbled up from both sides. So that's exactly what the liberals want this campaign to be about. The challenge for them is in Quebec, they're fighting the Bloc Québécois, and in all big parts of Ontario and the BC Lower Mainland, they're fighting the NDP. And then those are the two forces, more so than the Conservatives, that can get in the way and play spoiler mm -hmm. and stop that majority mm -hmm. government. And the vaccine battle isn't going to work there. Right. Because, uh, you know, the, the Legault has got high approval ratings. Mm -hmm. They're doing everything they can in Quebec to force right. people to get the jab. And the New Democrats are pro No, but what, what might work there would be that they have already uh, said, we, we, you know, we're, we're going to mandate vaccines for the federal workers. We're mm -hmm. going to uh, help provinces put in place vaccine passports or, or whatever you want to call them, domestic passports, in order to make things easier for people who are vaccinated. Uh, I, I think the, the hope would be that the people who are vaccinated are sort of fed up and they want to get on with things. And so people who aren't vaccinated uh, by choice, not because they can't be, uh, become sort of the, the, the minority. And, and Aaron O'Toole is in that, as, as David says, I mean, that really difficult position of having to balance out parts of his party. It is, it is the struggle, no matter the issue for him. And, and we are seeing it again with, with vaccination. Um, there are, there is a libertarian streak inside the party. Um, that's not saying we don't want to get vaccinated necessarily, but that is saying it has to be my choice and my life can't be dictated by the government and what they want for me. And, and that balance for him, um, we will see that time and again, whether it's about vaccines, whether it's about climate change, whether it's about other issues. So for him to focus on fiscal responsibility might be actually the safest area for him because he can make a lot of people, a lot of conservatives happy if he's talking about that. Right. I mean, I have to imagine that at this point, they're going to want to stop talking about the vaccination story at all, because, look, yeah. vaccination passports have pulled really, really well in this country consistently for the past few months. That is not a winning issue for the Conservatives. What might be a winning issue is saying, hey, this government has spent a lot of money, and if they keep spending all this yeah. money, inflation is going to go up. You're already seeing some, you know, That's certain right. grocery items, their price go up more and more. Life is going to become more unaffordable. And look, you know, if inflation goes up, then yeah. the interest rate goes up. 
And if the interest rate goes up, maybe you can't afford your house. Um, that is a good message. It might require like, yep. I don't know, like an entry level economics, you know, um, education to fully <laughs> land it, which is why, like, I think those Pierre yeah. Poliev ads were really effective because I think they uh, he was running those ads specifically in his writing. But they were so effective at sort of getting that message about affordability. And I'm I'm curious to see if Aaron O'Toole t picks that up and takes it national. Yeah. OK. Uh, thank you both very much. I'm going to put you on pause just for a moment on the right hand side of your screen. Soon you're going to see the prime minister leaving his house, arriving to this big house behind me, uh, Rideau Hall. But first, let's hear quickly from another voter about what they are watching for this election. My name is Lucia Fernandez. I'm a political science student at Ryerson University. I am doing a minor in environment and sustainability studies. <laughs> So I'm 19 years old. This is going to be my first election. Growing up, even going to school, we were always talking about climate change and seeing how it affects really every country, every part of the world. I think that's what makes me really passionate about it. For me, the most important thing this federal election is going to be a solid climate action plan. So I don't believe that climate change is a partisan issue. I'm just looking for someone who is going to prioritize clean energy, sustainable resources, conservation, and above all else, um, really centering underrepresented voices and communities. For people who don't prioritize uh, climate action, all I would really have to say is that it impacts us all in pretty much any aspect that you can think of. So I think the priority is really making sure that we have a planet to live on. Just another uh, voter keeping their eye on some of the issues that they want to hear about during the election. Climate change uh, will be a big one. It always is. But there are and have been uh, dozens, hundreds of forest fires, wildfires burning throughout the country this summer. Uh, temperatures stifling, uh, stiflingly high across the prairies. So uh, undoubtedly people will want to hear some meaningful conversation around climate policy too. That, though, is the front door of uh, Rideau Hall, where Justin Trudeau uh, will kick off his campaign speech after meeting with Mary Simon. That meeting has not happened yet. We'll start in about five to ten minutes' time. We'll see how long they're in there uh, for their conversation. And then Justin Trudeau will come out, uh, make a statement, and take some questions from reporters. He is headed to uh, Montreal after this event. He will not, however, be at the, the Pride event in Montreal. It has not really, it is not really going to be a traditional Pride event. There will also be an aspect of protest to it, to some of the COVID uh, pr um, uh, restrictions that are in place. So there will be MPs there. He will not be part of that, but he will be in Quebec. And Quebec, as, as you well know, in every election is so important to forming government, but it's also always a, a critical and fascinating battleground. The Bloc Québécois, the, the rise of it in the last election, the strength it has taken on becoming a real force once again in the province. And they're going to try and use this election to strengthen their position in parliament and also to say that they are best suited to uh, to defend Quebecers' interests inside parliament too. Rafi Bujikanian, we will talk to him in just a moment. But first, here's Yves-François Blanchet in 60 seconds. If it's good for Quebec, you can likely count on Yves-François Blanchet. The Bloc Québécois leader is looking to strengthen the province's position and build off his success from the last election. Blanchette helped bring his party back to life in 2019. And after securing 32 seats, Blanchette promised the party would go further still. Nous irons encore plus loin. All of the federal leaders have expressed support of Bill 96, a proposal to unilaterally change the Constitution to recognize Quebecers as a nation and French as its only official language. Blanchette has warned that Trudeau should not call an election in the midst of the pandemic, even putting forward a motion in the spring to debate and vote on an election date. Bien, bonjour, monsieur Expect dame. the bloc to focus on increasing health care transfers to the provinces and to expand old age security. Two points that came up during the budget. And with only one province to campaign in, Blanchette's focused on keeping Parliament in a minority and to convince Quebecers that his party is what's best for the province. 
So, uh, Yves-François Blanchet, yeah, he didn't want an election this past spring, but all the way around this time last year, uh, he was calling for the prime minister to resign and for an election to happen immediately. So things can change pretty quickly when it comes to what seems right for you politically. Rafi is, Rafi Bujikanyan is uh, with the Bloc Québécois and will be traveling with them for the next week. Uh, Rafi, tell us about what their goals are here uh, during this campaign and how important Quebec will be. Rosie, they want to protect their gains from last time around. They did triple their seat count and basically kept Justin Trudeau from a majority in 2019. And if you listen to leader Yves-François Blanchet, he wants to make more gains and become even more of a force in Quebec. It's interesting that I'm coming to you from Papineau today, from Justin Trudeau's writing. That does two things for Blanchet. He'll be easily able to attend the Pride Parade later. And of course, symbolically, it just shows how competitive he wants the bloc to appear to be this time around. If you recall what happened toward the end of the House of Commons session, I mean, it was basically a whole lot of, you know, clashing between the Bloc and the Liberals about who are the best protectors of French language and French culture. I mean, you know, the Liberals, of course, came out with their new update for the Official Languages Act. The Bloc turned around and said, well, that's just electoralist pandering, you know, um, how about this motion to recognize Quebec as a nation instead, like virtually in the same breath, saying that it hasn't been without controversy for Blanchette, though. Just last weekend, some 30 party members wrote a letter to him saying that he is betraying the democratic principles of René Lévesque because the bloc started putting in some preferred candidates in a few writings in Quebec. And the thought process was, you know, we just need to be ready for this election. And that's what Blanchette said. He said, look, I, know, I realize this is unpleasant for everyone involved, but, you know, we do need to be ready for this election whenever it is called. So these are pretty much the themes they'll be fighting on alongside, of course, the, the health transfers issue. And meanwhile, the Liberals have been just trying to sort of sideline them in Quebec. You saw that child care agreement Justin Trudeau signed with uh, François Legault just, just last week. And we'll see whether any of that is, is working or not. Blanchette's supposed to speak to us right after we hear from Justin Trudeau and Conservative leader Aaron O'Toole. Okay, Rafi Bujikanyan in Montreal this morning. Thanks, Rafi. We'll talk to you throughout the morning as well. Um, there on your screen, you can see on the left-hand side of your screen, uh, Rideau Hall, the front door of Rideau Hall. On the right-hand side of your screen, uh, Rideau Cottage. I don't think that's the front door. I, mm -hmm. I haven't been in it. It's maybe the side <laughs> door, the back door. Anyway, that's the door uh, the Prime Minister is going to emerge from shortly in order to make his way to Rideau Hall and uh, speak with the Governor General, Mary Simon. Ask her to dissolve Parliament. Uh, he, he will visit what is called an instrument of advice, if you want the technical term, that will recommend that Parliament be dissolved following an election call. Uh, the Governor-General will issue, if she agrees, which traditionally <laughs> Governor-Generals do agree, um, uh, she'll issue a proclamation on behalf of the Queen. The Chief Electoral Office will issue formal notices and, and things will get underway from a technical point of view. And the leaders will, will hit the road, uh, with the exception of Aaron O'Toole, who I think probably for um, optics reasons is choosing today to do his campaigning all virtually uh, from th this high-tech room they've got set up at the Westin in Ottawa. He's going to do a number of town halls. That is in part to allow him to say, this isn't the time for an election, but if you're going to do it, I'm going to do it safely from from this hotel room in downtown Ottawa. Um, let, let's talk a little bit about Quebec as we wait for... Um, the Prime Minister to emerge there, David. Um, I must say that the Liberals have worked very hard to keep François Legault, the Premier of yeah. Quebec, on side in, in the past number of months, whether it be the language policy, whether it be this daycare deal that they've now struck with seven, eight provinces? Everybody uh, except Ontario and Alberta. Right. Everybody except so that's, that's Oh, and New Brunswick. So and New Brunswick. Yeah, so, <clears throat> uh, so they, but the fact that they got Quebec on side, they got Saskatchewan on side just mm -hmm. towards the end of last week, which was maybe surprising. Um, Quebec, they have done a lot because they realize how important Quebec is to them there. And, and the Bloc, uh, you know, to their credit, is, is pushing hard to try and at least maintain the seats they have. So there's two things that uh, a couple of Liberals have raised with me about the dynamic in oh, Quebec right now. I'll just, I'll just, oh, I'll just say there he is with the whole family. He's coming. 
There we go. Um, we'll just show this shot here and, and come back to the issue of Quebec. So there's Justin Trudeau with his wife, Sophie Gregoire Trudeau, uh, his son, Xavier, who is now, I would say, like the same height as him, which is crazy, uh, his daughter, uh, Ella Grace, and uh, his and Hadrian is, is the little one there uh, to the right of the prime minister. They are all uh, walking over from their home to Rideau Hall. Uh, of course, it'll just be the prime minister who goes in to speak to the governor general. But these shots, um, all part of sort of what you're presenting to Canadians on the first day of you and your family and um, how you're all working together. As I said, it is literally just around the corner in the garden from where the prime minister lives. Um, so not the normal drive that you would have to make up. Um, it's incredibly convenient. It's you're very, have the if you're to going have, to call to an election, to, to just be in the backyard <laughs> in your house is probably good. Anyway, uh, sorry, I interrupted you around Quebec. No, a, a couple of things on Quebec. And, and it's interesting, uh, one issue that was raised with me, and they don't know how big of a problem this will be, but it is the appointment of Mary Simon, ex-governor general, and, and her inability yeah. to speak French. A yeah. lot of the French papers have seized on this and has made it an issue. And there is a sense with some liberals that it's undermined some of the work they've done on official languages policy, led primarily by Melanie Jolie, and, and could become, you know, a, a a little bit of, of, of an issue for the bloc to, to, to hammer on uh, throughout the campaign. But Legault is the big factor in a lot of ways. Uh, there, there's a real sense that in 2019, Francois Legault weighed in on multiple occasions on issues in the campaign, and everything from language policy to the secularism law. Yep. And each time he did it, it had this seismic impact on the polls, moving support towards the Bloc Québécois. And, and that cost them support in a lot of marginal seats, in particular in the suburbs of Montreal and some of the three-way splits. And, and, and they hope Legault will either be supportive or sidelined a bit more during this campaign to take that variability and that volatility uh, out of what happens with the electorate because, of course, Legault is competing against the Parti Québécois, the yeah. Sovereignist Party yeah. at the provincial level, so you don't want to float the BQ too high yeah. because of what it might do uh, you you know, want, in provincial politics. You essentially politics. want to keep François Legault quiet. You yeah. want to keep him out of things. And, and the yeah. other thing they need is they need Aaron O'Toole to do a bit better in Quebec. Uh, right. Because the Conservatives and the Bloc tend to compete for that same group of Francophone voters, uh, that same pool of voters. And, and the Liberals need O'Toole to come up in Quebec to provide them with favorable vote splits so they can win back some of those seats that the Bloc took by very narrow percentage points last time. So they kind of need O'Toole to be good in Quebec and bad everywhere else. And right. that gets them to the majority government uh, that, that they're counting on. And the Conservatives on. had 10 seats in yeah. Quebec in the last election. The NDP had one. Yeah. Uh, the NDP yeah. in Quebec are in trouble. I mean, yeah. as Alexander Boulouris, I mean, his riding literally borders the prime minister's riding. Like, yeah. they're right there in, in Montreal. The New Democrats are, I mean, Jagmeet Singh's in Montreal today. They want to hold on to Alexander Boulouris, but they have that, him and Jack Harris' seat in St. John's East are the only seats they have east of Ontario. Now, Jack Harris is not running. Mary Shortle, uh, a prominent labor leader, is running for them in St. John's, yeah. but that's going to be a tough hold for them. Boulouris is in a tough spot. I mean, you look at east of, of the Ontario border as potentially having no new Democrats when this is over. After the Jack Layton wave in 2011, that yeah. would be quite the thing to come out of this election. Yeah, and, and I think you will see the NDP. I mean, they may be starting in Montreal for all sorts of, of reasons, yeah. including uh, the, the Pride Parade there today. But I, I think you will see the NDP start to target regions where they can actually win and build off of, instead of spending time in places yeah. where, you know, it's maybe one seat. I mean, that's not going to get them much further. And, and even though Eric says they've got the momentum going into this, uh, I, I, you know, it would take a lot of momentum for them to break through further, I think. Yeah, Jagme Singh has the best numbers of any leader in terms of favorability and likability, and, and that can often be a leading indicator of party support. They like Jagme, they're, they're going to give it, take a shot at the party. Uh, the challenge for, for Singh is their opportunities are in the lower mainland, the interior of BC, northern Ontario, southwestern Ontario. Right. It's scattered and spread. Yeah. So it's not like they can whip around the 905 or suburban Montreal and are heavily in the lower mainland, I mean, the, the, and, and get the big concentration hits uh, that liberal leader Justin Trudeau is going to be able to do. So he, yeah. he's coming into this, you know, with a good argument that we made your life better during the pandemic. Yeah. We pushed them to go further on some of these economic supports than they wanted to go and keep them there. And, and you know, why do you want to change this now when we're really not right. through this thing yet? Yeah, and, and the, the NDP argument will be, uh, or the NDP goal would be to keep the liberals at a minority mm -hmm. and to be... Uh, you know, a, a deal maker and to be able to get things for Canadians as they say that they did. And, and, and to their credit, they did do at various times through the pandemic, whether it be pushing for uh, increased benefits, um, you know, for, for Canadians, for students, for all kinds of things. Here again, uh, the Prime Minister with his family just walking up. Oh, they're right behind me, actually, uh, <laughs> up along the side of Rideau Hall. 
um, where they will be greeted with the clerk of the Privy Council, the interim clerk of the Privy Council, Janice, uh, Janice Charette, and I believe the secretary um, to the Governor General, who will bring them inside uh, to officially make this request of the Governor General. On uh, this August 15th, not even two years since the last election, although almost, and reminder that minority governments do typically only last 18 to 24 months. So, you know, this, this would get us around the life cycle of minority government. But again, the, the, the issue for the, the Liberals, at least from this first day and maybe in the coming days, will be to make this argument about why this is needed right now um, and what, how Canadians should feel about having to go to the polls as we still battle um, this pandemic. They are now inside Rideau Hall. We don't expect that this will take an awfully long time, uh, but you know what we're going to do? We're going to take a short break here. Uh, we won't let you miss any of the action, don't worry. We'll be right back with more special coverage live from Rideau Hall. You're watching CBC. I don't think now's the right time. I think we're in the middle of a pandemic and just trying to get through that. There's other things to prioritize right now. The Liberals are leading in the polls. They've been doing a really good job dealing with the pandemic. It makes sense to for them to get a strong mandate uh, going forward. As long as it brings stability to the people in the community and, you know, more assurance, more foot to the pavement, less talking, you know, then, hey, maybe... It'll work. There's a lot of things going on and election shouldn't be really a topic right now. I think we need to focus on getting back in track, you know, getting our lives back to normal. I feel that nobody's in a mental state to really make any decisions and based off the way in which the world has been unfolding, it's kind of manipulative. I think it's way past time for change, so anything that expedites that, I'm glad for that. My name is Blaine McNamee. I'm a musician who bought a guitar store back in 2014. I live with my wife and son in Vancouver, British Columbia. The pandemic definitely changed the way we did business 
and had to go to, uh, to almost an entirely online sales platform. We were very lucky. Right. We didn't have to take wage subsidies. We were able to retain a number of our employees. Excellent. With an upcoming election, uh, I think the pandemic has, has shown us that a number of things have changed with the way we do business in Canada. And when I'm looking at parties, I think my main priority and the issue I will be paying the most attention to is going to be the economy. I think an investment on small, locally independent business is the best uh, investment our government can make. The right decisions coming out of Ottawa fiscally and financially to help grow and nurture a, an independent small business community and to grow our middle class. Okay, and that is uh, one voter looking for uh, what he thinks the election should be about and some of what he's been through as a small business owner through the pandemic. Indeed, economic recovery will be top of mind for the politicians and for Canadians. Welcome back here to uh, the nation's capital. I am just outside uh, Rideau Hall. That is Rideau Hall on your screen uh, and the podium where we will hear from Justin Trudeau. The kick of, off of his campaign, we'll bring that to you live as soon as he finishes meeting with Governor General Mary Simon. I'm Rosemary Barton, happy to be joining you on this lovely August uh, summer morning here in, in Ottawa. There are, of course, questions about why this campaign now, but the weather couldn't be better if you're looking to kick off a campaign. And look, there's some signs that a campaign was coming, whether we knew it or not. Uh, the signs already out and printed. Those are the signs uh, of Pablo Rodriguez, the Quebec lieutenant, the leader of the House for the Liberal Party. Our colleagues at Radio Canada got a, a sneak peek at some of those campaign signs. Something, as you know, you're going to see an awful lot of over the next 36 days. The uh, Liberal Party slogan, because they also released some TV ads uh, over the weekend, is forward together uh, as they start to think about the pandemic uh, moving forward. We are just minutes away from the official launch um, of the election, the 44th one for this country. I'm going to try and sneak in a quick chat with at issue because of course we'd make at issue come of out of their summer hiatus uh, for for this day and you're going to see a lot more of them as well Andrew Coyne, Chantal Bear, and Althea Raj all joining me on this Sunday morning hello everybody how I missed you nice to see you <laughs> good morning good morning yeah I told you I'd call again and probably sooner than you would have liked but here we are um, okay so the Prime Minister is, is meeting with the Governor General right now uh, we expect that this will sort of go according to plan but I do want to get all of you to ta have one take about about what he has to say or, or what he will say uh, to explain why this is happening now if there is anything that can explain why it's happening now Chantal why don't you start us off Oh, thank you. Um, I, I've, I've been curious to hear the rationale of the Prime Minister once he comes out. I'm not too sure that I can come up with a compelling, convincing one. But I'm guessing uh, it's going to be that the, the situation and the context has changed dramatically since the last election uh, in ways that no one could have imagined back then. Uh, and that uh, an election would pave the way for a fresh start uh, to the post-pandemic recovery. I'm not saying that should convince you. I'm not going to go into, I'm uh -huh. sure Mr. Trudeau is not telling the governor general, I believe that uh, we should have an election because I can win a majority and I'm sick of having to deal <laughs> with parliament and a, an opposition majority. But if you're looking for the rationale that makes it palatable yeah. for the governor general to say, yes, I'm guessing something like that, that the uh, uh, the ground has shifted and Canadians uh, should get an opportunity to appraise their political leadership and make a decision based yeah. on new circumstances. Yeah, and, and let me correct myself. I've already screwed up the Liberal slogan. It's actually forward for everyone just so that uh, I'll get that right by the time we're on day two of the uh, of the election. Uh, I'll, and I'll figure out everybody else's slogan too. Um, Andrew, y your thoughts on, on how and if the prime minister can, can make a convincing argument as to why this needs to happen? Well, he doesn't really have a convincing argument because the long and the short of it is he'd like to have a majority. I think, though, in politics, you, you know, you answer the question you'd like to hear rather than the question you were actually uh, given. And the, the question he'll, he'll want to answer is, why do I need a majority? 
Uh, and th then, then he'll be able to say, look, you know, if you like what we've been doing so far through the pandemic, uh, give us a majority. And here we, here's, what, here's all the other things we can do. Here's the larger vision that we've been sort of talking about until now. And he'll make a nod in the direction of, you know, if it weren't for the obstructionism and toxicity of parliament. But I think he'll try to keep the focus, uh, as you can see from that slogan, on uh, what's coming up, on the future, on here's the, here's the programs and, the, and the, the vision we'd like to enact, if only you'll give us a majority to do so. Yeah, it would be hard, Althea, to make the, make the argument solely on the idea that Parliament isn't working because they haven't lost a confidence vote. So that, you know, it is working perhaps not the way they want it to, but it is functioning. Uh, what else could he say here to make this a convincing uh, and compelling argument for Canadians? Well, I agree with Chantal. I think the focus is going to be in what we're hearing behind the scenes from liberal strategists is that it is going to be on the post-pandemic recovery. But it's not just convincing Mary Simon. I mean, this is essentially a vanity project. There is no reason why we need to have an election. And to your point, Rosie, back in the spring, the prime minister himself acknowledged that one of the great things about this parliament was how well all the opposition parties, especially in the early days of the pandemic, had worked together. The NDP is, you know, standing on the sidelines saying, we're ready to support you for a full mandate. So the the argument he has to put to people, but I don't think that uh, Canadians really care that much, is um, why Why now, right? Like, what has changed? And frankly, not much has changed. Uh, he has willing dance partners, even the Bloc, for example, on um, some of the Broadcasting Act changes, were, he, they were willing to dance with him. Uh, he, he does not need to have this election now. The truth is, the polls look great. They think that... There is no better chance than now if they wait a year because they'd have to wait through the Ontario election, through the Quebec election next fall. Uh, things might be uh, more controversial. There could be some new scandals. There, the Aaron O'Toole might have picked up. Um, and so the, t the timing is right, but of course he's not going to say that. <laughs> no, but, uh, uh, what about, uh, though, don't as, as Chantal says, yeah, go ahead, Chantal, yeah. But don't forget that uh, you could have said exactly the same thing about uh, the NDP in British Columbia a year ago or the Conservatives uh, in New Brunswick around the same period, i.e. minority governments who felt that the timing was good in the middle of a pandemic to get rid of the inconvenience of minority rule. Uh, and it worked rather well in both cases. It also yeah. means that yeah. both the Conservatives and the NDP at some point will reach the limit of how much of an issue they can make about the election call, because if it's good enough for John Horgan sure. or Blaine Iggs, uh, yeah. fellows uh, of those two parties, how could it suddenly be worse for Justin Trudeau? I think the, the, the debate over the election yeah. will take place, but I don't think it's going to be a long debate. And by the way, talking about election signs, I live in downtown Montreal. And the first thing I saw on Sherbrooke Street today close to the corner of Saint Laurent was a big Le Québécois sign. So can, can I just it's say not two just things. the liberals. Well, yeah, I mean, two things about that, yeah, if I, I mean, may. Jagmeet Singh was out campaigning for John Horgan, so it, it is hard to say that and then say you don't want one right now. Go ahead, Andrew. Yes, you may. <laughs> well, two things. First of all, every election is different. Federal elections are particularly a whole different kettle of fish than provincial elections. They're chess yes. in four dimensions. Uh, but secondly... Um, you know, the, the lead in a news story in a column plays two functions. One is to, to it has to attract people's interest on, on, in, in itself. But secondly, it preconditions everything that follows. It sets the logic for what comes. And similarly, with the first couple of days of an election, I agree, the whole election is not going to be about why did you call the election. But if yeah, the opposition yeah. can jump on this to use this to say, for example, uh, can you trust Justin Trudeau? Uh, does he have the same values and priorities that you do, or is he just doing this just for his own uh, you know, aggrandizement. It, it can it can color and shape the ensuing debates and discussions yeah. long after we're actually talking sure. about the early election call. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. It, can, it can become a thread that the the, the the opposition. Last word to you, Althea. Well, just on that point, because I agree with Andrew, you're completely right. It fits into the narrative that both the NDP and the Conservatives are trying to craft that Justin Trudeau is not in it for you, uh, no matter what uh, the the campaign slogan from the Liberals is, that he cares about his friends, you know, the, the controversy about the contracting during COVID that uh, firms, the opposition alleges, firms with Liberal ties were advantaged uh, over other firms, that uh, the Prime Minister has uh, an inability to see conflicts of interest um, 
pointing to the ethics commissioner's reports. Um, so I think that uh, if they sustain that thread, uh, then it yeah. could matter. But right now, this is basically today's story. Today's story is why do we need an election? Okay, I'm going to put you all on pause, but you'll come back. Thank you so much for already being here. I appreciate it. Uh, joining us early. You'll be back on the national, but you'll be back also uh, with me here through the morning. Thank you all very much. Uh, we are standing by for the Prime Minister to emerge from Rideau Hall. I'm told he's been in there now for a total of 14 minutes. I have people that track these things for me. Uh, the last time uh, he visited the Governor General, it was just over 30 minutes, in case you are... Um, like those kinds of historical facts. Um, as we've been talking about, of course, though, the election is taking place during a pandemic. We, we have some very high numbers of cases in parts of the country in a fourth wave. A lot of those cases uh, now affecting those who are unvaccinated. Uh, but Dr. Teresa Tam says that we are in that fourth wave now. Dr. Wong is an infectious diseases specialist, and he joins me from Regina. Nice to see you again, Dr. Wong. Pleasure as always, Rosie. Okay, so uh, w what do you think here? Uh, is it, will this be a, a safe thing to do uh, for leaders, for Canadians, for uh, candidates throughout the next uh, 36 days? I think the optics of safety are critical during the course of the election. And, you know, I think all candidates hopefully will, uh, you know, ensure that uh, safety is sort of top priority. I think, as has been mentioned, the dynamic is different now than it was obviously many months ago with uh, a large proportion of individuals, you know, adults being vaccinated. Um, so, again, I mean, you know, virtual means, uh, you know, sort of mail in votes and so forth. So, there are definitely ways to do this safely. Um, do you think that we are in the fourth wave right now? And, and who is the fourth wave uh, affecting the most right now? So I think we're definitely uh, at the start of our fourth wave, and we've obviously seen upticks in different parts of the country. I mean, the majority of the country is seeing upticks, especially in uh, Western Canada, uh, obviously, as well as Ontario, Quebec, and New Brunswick. Those are sort of the big provinces. Others are sort of lagging behind. And so definitely, uh, you know, what we're seeing, obviously, is persons who are hospitalized, the vast majority of persons who are hospitalized, severely ill, uh, are persons who are either only partially vaccinated or uh, not vaccinated at all. So obviously the system uh, has, has, has a responsibility to work as much as possible to, again, improve access, yeah. improve education, uh, you know, to get, uh, to get people vaccinated. And, and case counts are, are, are up and high, but it's, it's probably better at this stage, Dr. Wong, uh, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, to look at hospitalizations and deaths because you could still, uh, if you're vaccinated, you could test positive uh, for, for the virus still, but you wouldn't, you wouldn't have the same sort of outcome. Is that, is that fair to say? Yeah, correct. And so, again, if you're fully vaccinated, uh, again, we know that being fully vaccinated, you know, it's not 100% perfect, but it's still superbly good against, uh, you know, symptomatic infection, uh, even with Delta, as well as severe illness, hospitalizations and deaths with Delta. So you're probably looking at about 85% effective if you're fully vaccinated against getting infected uh, with symptoms and probably about, I don't know, 95% effective against uh, becoming severely ill or requiring hospitalization. And so, uh, as has been said, vaccine is really uh, decoupling cases, so to speak, uh, from hospitalizations yeah. and deaths. And again, that's what we're seeing right now across uh, the country as cases rise. You know, hospitalizations are rising, but so nowhere near where we saw again with uh, our yeah. second and third waves. I'll just end on this, Dr. Wong. All the campaigns have uh, COVID protocols, have people advising them, but but what will be tested and what wasn't ha didn't happen, obviously, during provincial elections, is that people will be traveling across the country, and regional public health rules are different from one province to the next, sometimes from one region to the next. How challenging do you think that will be for uh, the leaders, for the parties, as they adapt to different situations across the country? Yeah, Rosie, I think it's definitely complicated. At the same time, I honestly think that the smart optic here for parties and for, you know, people who are campaigning is just to be safe. Um, uh, again, I mean, yeah. you know, the public sentiment around, you know, a lot of this obviously has changed over the last number of weeks. We've seen obviously a lot of stuff about mandates and so forth. And so and there's a lot of people, especially the majority who are fully vaccinated, 
we just don't have a ton of patience for this stuff any longer. And so I, I just feel, again, no matter what the rules are, you know, uh, making certain that you're doing things in ways that are safe. For example, I saw the prime minister and his family walking outdoors, but had they had masks on, for example. So that, to me, yeah, yeah, is a good yeah. optic. And yeah. that's kind of what you need to portray during the course of the campaign. Okay, Dr. Alex Wong, so nice to see you again this morning. Appreciate you making the time for us. Thanks, Rosie. Okay, talk soon. Uh, I will tell you that the Prime Minister is still inside the <laughs> Rideau Hall. It's been about 20 minutes or so as he meets uh, with Mary Simon to, again, request uh, that Parliament be dissolved and that we uh, find ourselves in an election, the 44th election it would be if it happens, uh, as we expect later this morning. David Thurton is my colleague covering the Green Party this campaign. They have been in the news a lot uh, over the past couple of months. Uh, David Thurton doing a lot of that reporting, maybe not the kind of news they want. Uh, we'll talk to him in just a moment. But first, here's a look at Anime Paul in 60 seconds. It has not been an easy road for Green Party leader Anime Paul. Her party and her leadership have been in the news for all the wrong reasons. They produced a list of allegations that were so racist, so sexist. Bitter infighting, accusations of racism and a high-profile defection has exposed the Greens' internal rifts to a national audience. It's been a far cry from the promise Paul's election last October was meant to signal. She is the first black woman and Jewish woman to lead a major federal party. I am clearing a path for myself but I am also clearing one for those who come after me. This election could be a fresh start for Paul and her chance to win a seat for herself. But she will need to sell voters on her social justice platform if she hopes to convince her party and Canadians that she has a political future. All right, so that is a look at Anime Paul and the Green Party. Anime Paul is still a, a candidate, a leader who is becoming known, I would say, to, to most Canadians. Uh, some people don't know her that well, so that'll be a first challenge for her, uh, David. Uh, and also winning winning her own seat, because she is a leader without a seat in, in Parliament right now. David is in Toronto, uh, where the Green Party is going to kick things off. What are we expecting there today, David? Yeah, so after the Prime Minister comes out and we are officially plunged into this election, we'll hear from Annemi Paul. She's going to be addressing her supporters, her constituents, her candidates. She's going to be doing some campaigning here in Toronto Centre. As you mentioned, this has been a bruising last couple of months for the Green Party and Annemi Paul herself. Right now, they are entering this election in a way that, you know, they didn't really want to, to be, you know, the... The, the controversy, the turmoil within the Greens has distracted the party from focusing, from preparing. They haven't been able to fundraise, strategize the way that they would have liked to. They don't even have a national campaign director, Rosie. So, you know, this means that the party, all of this means that the party will not be able to run you know, a campaign that they would typically run, something that we would see from the Greens. So the leader's not going to be traveling the country and going to, you know, potential seats where the Greens could pick up some support, some votes. Annemie Paul is going to be focusing right here in her riding of Toronto Centre, which perhaps is a blessing in disguise, because people are telling me within the party that there is no path forward for Paul if she does not get a seat in the House of Commons. She does not have a seat right now. She needs to win Toronto Centre if she is going to stay on as leader. It is do or die, Rosemary, for, uh, for Annemie Paul. And just to remind people uh, that as well as the controversy uh, around Annemi Paul and her leadership from inside her own party, part of what fueled that is uh, Jenica Atwin, the, uh, the, uh, the Green Party MP who crossed the floor to become a Liberal MP. And that, that created a lot of, um, a lot of issues for, for Paul, the fact that she couldn't seem to hang on to an MP and then raise questions about, about her leadership. And, and there were hopes, I think, David, that they could not only hold on to that seat, uh, the Jenica Atwin won, but build off it. And now that those hopes are, are, are very much, I think, in question. A hundred percent. You know, this was supposed to be, you know, the, you know, every election is supposed to be a breakthrough election for the Greens, but they were hoping that this was going to be an sure. election where, you know, they could soar. They have a new leader. Climate change is a big issue, especially right now with the wildfires and the, the heat dome and all that kind of stuff. It's on top of yeah. the minds of voters. But this is not going to be, uh, you know, at least it's going to be it's, it's a difficult time for them. They're starting this campaign off um, with so many challenges, yeah. Rosemary.
All right, and as you say, David, the, the real, the first challenge for uh, Annami Paul to win that riding, Toronto Centre. She's not choosing an easy riding to win either. She's got some strong competition there, certainly in the form of the Liberal MP, soon to be candidate, Marcy. And thank you, David. We'll come back to you through the morning. Appreciate it. That's David Thurton. He's in Toronto. Yeah. The Prime Minister is still inside Rideau Hall, about 25 minutes now in there, meeting with the Governor General. There's probably coffee or tea, as well as uh, conversations about why Parliament should be dissolved at this time. Traditionally, Governor Generals, though, um, hear those arguments and accept the advice of the Prime Minister and, and call an election. Probably the most Probably the longest time I looked at that very door would have been uh, with Stephen Harper in 2008, 2009, when he visited then Governor General Mikhail Jean looking for a prorogation of Parliament in the face of the beginnings of a coalition. Uh, you might remember with the Liberal Party, the NDP under Jack Layton and the Bloc Québécois saying it would support uh, confidence votes on a case-by-case -case basis. The Prime Minister at the time, uh, Stephen Harper, uh, wanted a prorogation in order to take a little breath before another uh, group of uh, parties decided to form government. It was a long and stressful meeting, we know now, uh, but it did end with that prorogation and an election was eventually avoided. The coalition collapsed, but it was a long time looking at that very wooden door. Um, I don't expect it'll be that long here uh, this morning. Ashley Burke is here at Rideau Hall as well, and she'll be heading out on the hustings uh, with the Liberal leader once this all gets going. Ashley, what are you hearing about where Justin Trudeau will be going and what kinds of things he'll be doing today? Because these first moments start, start to give you an indication of what's important to the party and the campaign in the early hours. Well, just seconds ago, I got dropped off this bag and it's full of rapid tests that the Liberals are going to be requiring that we take on a daily basis in order to be able to go in the campaign. We know that after this, Trudeau is going to be having a virtual um, meeting with all of his candidates and then he's going to be getting on his campaign bus. The first stop is in the Montreal region where, of course, Papineau is his home riding, but it's also a key battleground for the Liberals. They've got 35 seats in Quebec they want to hold on to and potentially grow. The rest of the itinerary, it hasn't been released yet. Yet, but we know that Toronto, Vancouver, some of those urban centres outside of the GTA also key battlegrounds. We expect Trudeau to hit those ridings hard and early on, as well as spending time in Atlantic Canada and as well uh, Alberta, where the Liberals think that they have a potentially three seats that they could turn red, another two that they're eyeing. But the Liberals uh, need to keep all of their seats, gain another 15 if they want to get to that majority that they're seeking. And how often are you, uh, just to go back to the rapid test, David's got some here as well. I'm going to make him do it live on TV probably, just, but I won't do that to you, Ashley. Uh, how many times, how you. often are you expected to do that? Have you been given any indication of, of how, how many times you're expected to do that through the week, through the day? Well, this bag was just dropped off right now because um, we've got to do it an hour before we get on the bus, which is around 1 p.m. So David and I are going to have to do this pretty soon. We're told every day these rapid tests need to be done in order to be part of the campaign. And that if you do test positive, you're not getting on the bus that day until you do probably a PCR test. The Conservatives are also going to be doing rapid testing. There's a whole host of measures that the parties are putting in place uh, as long as uh, talking to yeah. experts. And one of the other things that's interesting is the Bloc Québécois, they're putting plexiglass inside their bus to separate uh, the journalists that are inside and the staff because it's considered a workplace. You spend so much time on the bus, yeah. you know, working during the campaign that that's a measure that they're they're taking. Yeah, I mean, just one of the, the many challenges this uh, campaign will, will have because of the pandemic. And as we've said, you do have to be vaccinated to go on these buses and planes. Um, but you're going to be out and about. You're going to be, at, you know, meeting Canadians at rallies, I would imagine, you know, mostly outdoors. And that's part of why the timing could be explained as well by the fact that, you know, you don't want to see the country be plunged into an election in the winter when you're just not going to be able to do things. I, I see you reading your instructions there. I'm a little bit afraid, Rosie. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm not going to lie. Uh, we, we have to do this every single day. And, uh, you know, it's got to go... Right up there. Right There's one option stem. that I have yeah. to do this. Insert the swab into the nostril parallel to the palate. It should be equivalent to that from the ear to the nostril. Anyway, uh, this is something we have to do every single day. So this is, we had to sign uh, an attestation, essentially, as the CBC to the campaign that we are all double vaccinated, and we are. I mean, if you follow us on Twitter or Instagram, you've seen our pictures. And, and then we have to do this. It's a fairly complicated process by the looks of it. And we have to do this every single day. And as Ashley was saying, it's like if we get a positive, and rapid test, sometimes you do get the false yep, positive. Yep. This is something we're all worried about. you got to get off the campaign, isolate, arrange for a PCR test. Now... 
if we go to St. John's, I'm hoping I get a false positive so Stop I can spend it. some time in Newfoundland because <laughs> I didn't get there this summer because of the silly election. But it just shows you how different things are. Like, yes. what if there are, is an outbreak on a campaign plane? Yeah. What if the Liberal leader, what if the Conservative, what if any of the leaders get there? And and while they're taking precautions for the campaign, and you know, you're talking to the doc, Dr. Wong earlier, an election you can do safely. You just throw money at it. You have more polling stations. You have more spacing, more days. Campaigning is a different thing because mm -hmm. there's only so much you can control. So there's going to be a lot of events outside, yep. and they'll try to have restrictions on people coming in and out. But what if anti-mask protesters show up, anti-vaccine protesters show up, anti-lockdown pro protesters show up? These are the variables with unvaccinated people who can be spreading because that's yep. where the thing is that we're all a little bit worried about yeah. as we get ready to go on, on, but on as, this But as, as I said, there are people advising the campaigns on, on how to do yep. this properly. Um, it, obviously, they're looking at public health restrictions in the regions where they are. Obviously, the preference is to do things outside. There'll be contact, um, you know, they'll take people's contact information in case they have to get to a contract tracing uh, situation. I would also imagine that campaigns will think twice about going to places with very low vaccination rates. Yeah. There are some of those in Alberta, southern Manitoba, yeah. and other places. And, you know, do you want to bring your whole uh, circus to a place where there's, you know, a 25% vaccination rate, 30% vaccination rate, and that is the case in some parts of the country, you probably don't. Um, so th those are also be things that, that have to be considered. But, uh, you know, in this province, in the province of Ontario, I think it's 80, more than 80% of Ontarians are double vaxxed now. Uh, and, those and, over 12, anyway. And, and so the issue of how they're going to approach this, right? Yeah. So you have this patchwork quilt of, of different public health restrictions across the country. And I know one of the things the Liberals are contemplating is going with the lowest common denominator. Denominator. So in Ontario, for example, you can have an outdoor rally of up to 100 people. So everywhere they go in the country, they would limit it to that because Alberta has no restrictions. Canada today, sort of basically it all went away and you can have unlimited crowds and gatherings. We had the Calgary Stampede and all of that. So mm -hmm. while you could technically go into Calgary and have five, six, seven hundred people there, uh, they're going to try to keep the, the lid on things a little bit because if you're going to run on responsible COVID management, we're the party of vaccines and we want to get through this quickly, you need to be seen to be taking a prudent and sensible approach to, to how you're dealing with these things uh, in the public square during the campaign when, when the entire yeah. country's watching. Yeah, and, and, and worth remembering that Elections Canada, too, has been preparing for um, an election in a pandemic time. And they also have, as you say, brought in various measures in order to make sure that they can keep people safe, too, including uh, the possibility of mail-in ballots, special ballots for people who don't want to venture out and vote in person. There are a couple of foreign uh, news stories, foreign affairs issues, that are making the rounds today, important developments. First of all, let me just remind everyone about the uh, massive earthquake that, that shook Haiti on, on Saturday. Um, there are hundreds of people dead in that country, and I mention it because Canada does offer a lot of support and development aid to Haiti, and there are so many Canadians um, who have relatives and family in Haiti. That will undoubtedly be an issue in these early days of the campaign, our support of the uh, devastation that's happening in, in Haiti at this hour. But the other big story, too, is the fall of, uh, of Kabul. We are, are hearing multiple uh, news reports this morning that the Afghan president has now fled uh, Afghanistan. Uh, as you know, the U.S. troops are... Uh, moving out of Afghanistan, Talib, the Taliban has taken over control of vast parts of the country. And um, it, is, it is not going well, to say the very least. We have suspended diplomatic relations there. Um, all through the morning, the Americans have been shuttling in and out with Chinook helicopters to remove personnel um, and others from uh, Afghanistan as we see the country um, essentially in collapse uh, with the Taliban taking control. That is, is an issue for this country um, because uh, we served so long in Afghanistan um, and we lost so many people in Afghanistan as well. Um, and and there will be questions about whether we should be doing anything right now to help to help um, create some stability in the country. Obviously, it's, it's, the, it's the decision by the Americans to pull out entirely mm -hmm. that has led to this chaos. Um, but it, 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 I know that there's lots of Canadians out there who um, spend a lot of time in Afghanistan wondering how it could have gotten to this. Yeah, and you've, you know, Canada still has this ongoing and unfulfilled commitment to evacuate and resettle uh, people who helped yeah. Canada and aid agencies and media organizations as interpreters yes. and fixers and guides in Afghanistan. The promise to bring 20,000 refugees here, you have to wonder how that could possibly be done effectively with the Taliban taking increasing control um, of the country and now with the president uh, reportedly fleeing. And in sharp contrast to what's happening here, Rosie, while 
our Prime Minister is in there talking to the Governor General about dissolving Parliament. Yep. The United Kingdom's Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, has asked the Speaker to recall Parliament to deal specifically with the crisis that's emerging in Afghanistan. Um, so that's a contrast you could expect, uh, you know, the, the, the foes uh, of the Prime Minister, the Conservatives in particular, uh, to seize upon today. And, and you know, the, the best laid election plans is Harold Macmillan, the old United Kingdom Prime Minister, who said, what, bother, what does he worry about? Events, dear boy, events. What's happening in Afghanistan is one of those events that, that can derail an election you wanted to be about COVID and the recovery. Um, it, it's now a serious humanitarian crisis where Canada still has unfulfilled commitments yes. to hundreds, if not thousands, of people who helped us during that war. Yeah, and, and many of the uh, rights that, we've, that we helped put in place for women and girls in particular um, as part of our mission in Afghanistan have also now uh, fallen by the wayside as Sharia law takes place. The Taliban saying that women will still have rights, but there seems to be no indication that that's really the way forward this is going to be. Um, and lots of questions, obviously, for the Biden administration about um, how they could let this happen, um, frankly. So that will be a question, uh, perhaps, to the prime minister this morning, because so many Canadians do have... Um, it, you know, do have a vested interest in Afghanistan, given the amount of time we spent there. And we should say, too, though, that, that foreign policy issues, um, you know, to be frank, rarely define an election. But they can be important moments in sort of showing leadership on uh, policy issues. And, and to that end, let me bring in Eric Grenier and Elamin Abdul Mahmoud to, to be part of this conversation, too. And, Eric, maybe I'll, I'll go to you on that. You know, uh, we all remember uh, the Syrian refugee crisis and, and as that was unfolding in the 2015 election and how it did become a real flashpoint uh, for Canadians and for um, the government at the time, Stephen Harper's government, and for Justin Trudeau. It became a defining moment, too, of his, of his campaign when he said that he would bring in uh, refugees. I, I would say... Uh, that campaign was a lot longer. It was 78 days. And so there was perhaps more time to talk about more things. But tell us, remind us, you know, how foreign policy issues factor into domestic elections, generally speaking. Yeah, that did uh, change the dynamic of that campaign at the time that that happened. The three parties, the Liberals, the Conservatives, and the New Democrats, were literally neck and neck in the polls. Each of them had about 30 percent support. Right. So it really was a key moment where things could have shifted. Uh, foreign policy, though, as you mentioned, not often really the campaign focus. You know, you'd have to maybe the free trade election, uh, elections back uh, around, you know, the First World War or something like that. But it's very rarely that it becomes yeah. the issue. But as you mentioned, it often is a... Uh, a time for uh, a leader to show leadership. And uh, we saw that in 2015, that mm -hmm. it did have an impact on uh, the outcome of that election. And, and so what are the issues that, that people are, are thinking about that are top of mind, according to public opinion polls right now, Eric? Well, it is still, COVID-19 is still one of the top issues. It was dropping uh, as cases were dropping, but as cases have been uh, picking up over the last few weeks, COVID-19 as an issue has become important again. But we have seen that as COVID-19 as an issue has become less important, things like the environment, things like health care and the economy have become the bigger issues in this campaign, <coughs> more or less the traditional issues. Uh, but I, I think for the Liberals, yeah. they have pulled quite well on their handling of the pandemic. So if COVID-19 remains a top issue, that is, in a cynical way, something that could actually help them. Okay, and, and uh, I'll bring in El Amin there. I mean, you know, I, I, people often ask me in the days leading up to an election, what will the election be about? And my answer is, I, if I knew that, I would be really <laughs> amazing, at my, even better at my job, El Amin. Uh, <laughs> generally, the election is not about what you think it's going to be about, um, but it is, it is really Canadians uh, who start to define, you know, what it's about by, by the things that they ask and, and want to know, and also by the turns that, that the campaign takes. So I I won't ask you what it's going to be about, but what do you think are, are the issues that Canadians want to hear about um, through this election? I mean, you know, boy, oh boy, David, or David Cargan talks about events, dear boy, events. I mean, like the polls three weeks yeah. ago um, said, you know, the, the numbers were looking good for the Liberals. Um, they're just about as good as they are now. However, the events are quite different. You know, the fourth wave at the time was a question mark. Now it's a certainty. Um, there's this anxiety about, han about handling Afghanistan that wasn't on anyone's radar three weeks ago. Um, one of the two Michaels was handed a prison sentence. Like, that is something that we are dealing with as a, as a country. Yes. And so yep. the, these That's things right. could really, you know, overpower the optimism that the Liberals had because of those numbers, because 
If they had pulled this trigger three weeks ago, that would have been a different conversation. They're doing it today, and like this is a moment where you're seeing these particular events um, that could color the whole thing. And so we've really no idea what the, what the question is going to be. Um, we we got to wait for the, for the prime minister, I guess he will be the liberal re leader when he comes out, um, to say what he wants the election to be about. But even then, there's yeah. no telling that's going to be the, the thing that we end up talking about. Yeah, and, and just let me correct myself on Afghanistan. I said that we suspended diplomatic relations. It's uh, diplomatic operations, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, we, we, it's just not safe for embassy staff or others to, to be in Afghanistan at this time. So people there are also being evacuated. That has started a couple weeks ago. Um, and as David mentioned earlier, refugees um, uh, now part of, of what Canada is trying to expedite. Um, I, I would imagine that that can continue to take place uh, while the government is in caretaker mode, particularly given the urgency of the situation. It's not as though that part would be suspended, um, but that's something to keep an eye on, as well as, as El Amin rightly points out, uh, the question of China, which is one that the Conservatives um, really want to stick to the government. Uh, they believe that the government has mishandled its relations with China has not done enough to, to free Michael Spavor and Michael Kovrig. Uh, Michael Spavor um, was recently sentenced. We are waiting a verdict in the case of Michael Kovrig. But these are ongoing dynamics where, again, maybe less about the foreign policy itself and much more about uh, government's decisions and leadership on that issue. We are 41 minutes now inside uh, Rideau <laughs> Hall with Justin Trudeau meeting with uh, Mary Simon. Now, this is the governor general he just appointed two weeks ago. So maybe they, you know, uh, I would assume they're friendly, they're catching up, um, as well as making the case for why an election has to happen right now. Uh, but that conversation ongoing. Uh, Justin Trudeau will come out when that happens. He will make a statement where we are told he will touch on things like Afghanistan, given the news today. Uh, and then he will head out to, uh, to Quebec right after. And David Cochran will stick a swab up his nose with his <laughs> rapid test, and he will hit the hustings, Yay. too. <laughs> I've never yeah. been happier not to go on the road, David Cochran. Um, uh, I'm just oh. glad it's a nasal swab. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, so so maybe I'll just do a little round on Quebec because that is the first place where Justin Trudeau is going. It's where uh, Jagmeet Singh is, obviously. It's where the bloc leader is. Um, Elamine, I haven't heard you on Quebec yet, so maybe I'll just get you to weigh in on what you, what you think um, Quebec holds for these parties and why it is so important. Well, David, earlier you talked about uh, all the seats that the, the Liberals need to hold on to um, in the, around the Isle of Montreal. And that is the place that we are watching. Um, I remember that we were talking about the NDP seat that is right, that is right next to Papineau. Um, I am so curious about the, the, the momentum that Jagmeet Singh has, because every poll is telling us how popular he is. Will this translate to um, him keeping any of those seats and uh, increasing those seat numbers? I don't know, but uh, the TikToks look fun. I don't know if those end up translating to anything <laughs> meaningful, right? Like, I, they really do. I really, yeah, but like, yeah. all we hear is about these young voters and um, they are watching and they're interested in the TikToks. And I don't want to be the cynical person who says that young people don't listen uh, when politicians are asking something of them. Um, but that is, uh, that's a thing, that's a dynamic that I'm watching for. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would say, Eric, from my vantage point, that Jagmeet Singh will have to turn TikToks into something uh, more substantive and more meaningful uh, in order to, well, A, convince people to go vote, because the, the people he is speaking to, as Elamine points out, aren't necessarily the ones who make their way to the polls. Um, and he has to give them a reason. And, and it, it has to be more than the social media campaign, which is highly effective, but I'm, I'm not sure um, has the weight that's needed to, to push people to go and vote for him. But maybe I'm wrong. Uh, Eric, you, you weigh in there. Yeah, well, the NDP, the issue for them is that they always, or they often have lots of potential, but it often doesn't come out at the polls uh, on election day. Yeah. So I think that is the challenge. They're at 19% in the polls right now, which is good. It's better than 16 last time, yes. but 19% is a traditional level of support for the New Democrats. And I think for Jagmeet mm. Singh, he does have the best favorability numbers uh, personally. The issue is that I think that leaders that are generally seen as not as much in contention for becoming prime minister can be viewed differently. Jack Layton was always viewed a little bit differently than yes. some of the other leaders. So that is a, an issue as well. You can like someone a lot, but if it comes down to whether you are prepared to 
uh, elect him to become prime minister, that can be a very different question. So for the yeah. New Democrats, it's all about whether they can get that potential to become something real. And the amount of support that they have among young voters is very significant. But as you mentioned, they need to have a reason to go out and vote. In 2015, legalization of marijuana was one of those factors. Not exactly uh, yeah. sure what the issue would be in 2021. That would get lots of young voters out to the polls. I have to say, I do think reconciliation, it, it seems to be a big issue, just like anecdotally. Uh, I think a lot of young Canadians are, are very engaged uh, with that and, and want governments to do more, do better, uh, want to be strong allies for um, Indigenous peoples. That, that does seem to be an issue. I don't know if it drives people to the polls, but uh, that seems to be one. And I think climate change, too, and correct mm -hmm. me if I'm wrong there, Eric, but that, that continues to be... Um, not just a young person's issue, but one that they are very passionate about. Um, and if they heard things that they liked or disliked, um, that, that could be a factor in who they vote for, too. Yeah, absolutely. We shouldn't suggest that most yeah. young people aren't going to be uh, going out to vote. A turnout for, among young, young voters yeah. was very high in 2015, and it was it went down in 2019, but was still higher than it used to be. So a lot of those voters that might have came out for the first time in 2015, yeah. they came out again in 2019. So young voters are getting more engaged, but for the New Democrats, they really need to make sure that they're supercharged and that they go out in the polls in really enormous numbers. Yeah, and that it, it, the ground game factor uh, is important there. And we know uh, by virtue of money and uh, machinery that the Liberals and Conservatives have a stronger game uh, than the NDP and the other parties, for sure. Um, I'm, I'm informed here that someone put a glass of water on the podium, so I am that's hopeful a, that's that that's a sign <laughs> yeah. of uh, a prime minister coming out soon. He's been in there for uh, 45 minutes at this point as we wait for him to come out and tell us that, indeed, this election is underway. This will be Justin Trudeau's third election. Um, he, is, he is now, though, um, and I will say this with all due respect to the prime minister, um, the old guy on the block. He was, uh, <laughs> he was very young when he became prime minister. Uh, but uh, Aaron O'Toole, Jagmeet Singh... Uh, and Annamie Paul, all, all younger uh, than Justin Trudeau, incredibly. That's where we have ended up in our uh, political time. But he is also the most experienced um, at running federal campaigns, at being a leader, um, at knowing how to campaign and how to win. So this, for him, um, you know, a, a comfortable place for him. Uh, the, that, the same cannot be said, probably, for Aaron O'Toole, who, I, I will say, though, everyone I talk to around Aaron O'Toole says he's in uh, great shape and ready to go uh, in fighting form, if you will. Um, Jagmeet Singh's done this once before, did not perform well, but the party decided that he did deserve another chance, uh, even though it was not the outcome that they hoped for. So... Um, I will go to um, downtown Ottawa at this stage. Hannah Thibodeau is at the Conservative <laughs> Party headquarters, and she's going to give us a sense of, oh, that's all the party headquarters. Exciting. So the Greens <laughs> there on the bottom left, the Conservative Party, and the NDP who are starting their campaign in Montreal. Um, Hannah, I, I, I'll bring in everybody else after, but, you know, there are some people mm -hmm. saying, oh, okay, Aaron O'Toole is not going on an airplane. He's just going to stand in that hotel room all day but this is this is a this is a particular decision they've made for a particular reason yeah. and it doesn't mean he won't travel this is just how things are starting yeah, absolutely. And one of the things you were talking about before you let into me is that uh, Justin Trudeau really is the most experienced leader on this campaign when it comes yeah. to going out there, doing these types of events. However, let's put it into this perspective. This is a COVID campaign. We are in the midst of the fourth wave, as the doctors are telling us. And when it comes to the leaders, the person that has the most experience in campaigning during COVID is Aaron O'Toole. Remember, they had their leadership race in the midst of the pandemic. None of the other leaders have had that type of experience. So when it comes to reaching Canadians virtually, uh, doing different events, not maybe on the ground, but in studios like this, these are the types of experiences that Aaron O'Toole might have over the other leaders, even, you know, Justin Trudeau, even though he did do an international event during a pandemic, when it comes to campaigning, you can see that Aaron O'Toole might have the edge over the other leaders during uh, a COVID campaign. And being here too, Rosie, 
One of the things that Aaron O'Toole and his team are pitching is safety because of the fact that we are in or moving into this fourth wave. There's a lot of concern that the numbers will continue to rise, in particular in provinces like Alberta and Ontario, in Quebec as well. Uh, and they want to play it safe. They want to have this backup plan so that if they have to go full studio all the time because the numbers are on the rise, they can do so. But expect to see them here about two to three times per week. Heading out on the road as well, as you're mentioning, they do have planes, they do have buses, but expect to see a lot of this studio and it's gonna be that different campaign feel as well. We're sitting here going, this is different. We're not heading out on the road on the first day. We're here and later today as well, Rosie, he's gonna have this virtual conference with people from Montreal and one with Vancouver. So they've gone through the telephones. They're picking out what they say are just random numbers of people to see if they wanna ask Aaron O'Toole questions. We're not gonna be able to see who these people are, which is kind of a little different, yeah. but he will take questions from the electorate. So we'll see how that goes a little bit later today too. Yeah, a couple things. Just to remind people, Annamie Paul also did a virtual leadership campaign, so she would have some experience, although not that, probably not to the extent, as you say, that, that Aaron O'Toole would have, certainly not. And, and the Conservatives spent a lot of money on, on that setup where you are, so they also need to use it. They, they, they like it. They think the monitors and the camera angles um, work. Certainly there's lots of great production values. But I would also think, Hannah, that for... Um, for a, a leader who still needs to be known to, to some Canadians, you know, mm -hmm. getting out on the road will be important too. And I wonder if that strategy won't change over the course of the campaign, you know, that they decide, well, we're not going to stay here three days. It is harder to connect yeah. with people uh, virtually. It is harder to meet people on the street. There are lots of, you know, there, there's lots of, sure, good safety reasons. You can understand why you would want it for a backup. But I would also think that given the challenges, particularly for Mr. O'Toole's own popularity numbers, which are not good uh, in almost all public opinion polls, that he would need to get out there and meet people and see people and, you know, be seen bumping elbows or whatever he's allowed to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we think of the campaigns, uh, we go way far back to other campaigns where it's shaking hands and kissing babies. And that's one of the big things, those big crowds. We are not going to see the big crowds like we've seen in the past. They're going to minimize those numbers. In particular, uh, provincial health authorities simply aren't going to allow the big crowds. As you mentioned, though, Rosie, right. when it comes to Aaron O'Toole, he is still not a well-known leader. And yes, he does have to get his face out there. I'm told that this is going to be a different campaign style for the Conservatives. So it will be quite fascinating to watch if this type of virtual studio two to three times a week will actually work for them or if they will change tactics and hit the road more frequently like we've seen in other campaigns in the past where, yes, they are out there getting their faces face to face with other Canadians but they're yeah. going to try to find yeah. ways to get that face to face contact without having to put themselves in a situation where it might not be as safe like for example heading to yeah. the pride today uh, he won't be heading to that and it's big crowds there so there are those safety concerns right now too. Okay, Hannah Thibodeau there at Conservative Party uh, headquarters, uh, or the campaign headquarters anyway, where she will be, well, all day, because everything's happening virtually in that <laughs> hotel room. Thanks, Hannah. <laughs> we'll come back to you through uh, the welcome. morning as well. Uh, we're going to head over to Montreal uh, with uh, CBC's Olivia Stefanovic. That is the podium where Jagmeet Singh will be speaking once things get moving. They haven't they aren't moving because we are still waiting for the Prime Minister to come out of Rideau Hall and kick things off. Um, I think, Olivia, though, that we can see on that podium the NDP's slogan for this election, if I'm not mistaken. That, that's right, Rosie. And I just want to show you the scene here because there is a bit of a crowd gathering waiting for Jagmeet Singh. As you can see at, at the podium here, the slogan is fighting for you. And that really is the message that the NDP want to convey to voters uh, if and when, of course, this election. And, you know, Rosie, we're in the riding of Laurier St. Marie. We're in. And he feels 
they might have a chance of picking up from the Liberals. This is currently held by Liberal MP Stephen Guibault, who's a cabinet minister. And, you know, after seeing reacts to Justin Trudeau's speech, he is expected to attend the Montreal Pride Parade. And the reason, that's the, really the reason why his campaign is kicking off here in Montreal. The, the Montreal Pride, they invited Singh and the NDP to come to the parade. And so the party made this commitment and they said they didn't want to break it. So that's why uh, the NDP's campaign is kicking off here. Of course, Quebec is a province where the NDP have lo lost a lot of seats. They only have one seat right now. And they hope to um, get, get more support from people on the ground by by being here and speaking to voters and coming to events like the Pride Parade, even though there will be a large crowd gathered there, Rosie. And, you know, I, there will be a lot of young people as well at this parade. And we know that the NDP feel they have a good chance at bringing out uh, more young voters to the polls on Election Day. They feel like uh, Singh can appeal to, to young voters, that he has that likability factor, an authenticity factor that appeals to uh, younger voters and even first-time voters. And he will be able to meet a lot of those people at the parade later today. And that riding where you are, Olivia, such a fascinating riding to watch, uh, Laurier St. Marie, because it was, of course, the, the riding for the former Bloc Québécois leader, Gilles Duceppe, for, I think, 20 years before mm -hmm. he lost it in 2015. It was taken by the NDP at that, that point in, in 2015. And now, of course, as you said, uh, it's the, uh, the riding of the heritage minister, Stephen Gilbo. So it is one of those ridings that can be a hard-fought battle for sure and a place where the NDP has had some success previously. Um, just before I let you go, Olivia, do you have a sense of where you're off to next after Quebec? Yes, well, after Montreal, we're headed to Toronto, where Singh will be campaigning in the Danforth, which was Jack Layden's riding. That's also a Liberal-held riding that the NDP hopes to take away from the Liberal Party. And then we're going to Brampton, where Singh's uh, family is in Brampton East. That's actually uh, the area where uh, Singh was a... Was, uh, a provincial uh, M MPP for Ontario. So he's going back to his stomping grams, uh, gr grounds there. And then we're headed to BC, where, of course, he has um, his, you know, where, where he's elected to meet his constituents. But we, we will be going to other areas of BC where the NDP feel like they can uh, get grow, grow their support in Western Canada, Canada and then even the prairies, okay. Rosie. Okay, great. Olivia, you've got a, a busy number of days ahead. Thank you very much. We'll speak to you again. That's Olivia Stefanovic traveling with the NDP in Montreal. It's been 55 minutes and the Prime Minister is set to emerge from uh, Rideau Hall. We've been given the one minute warning here on site. Uh, he was meeting, of course, with the Governor General, Mary Simon, uh, with the advice that Parliament needs to be dissolved. A long meeting, uh, I have to say, a bit longer than I would have expected. Although, really, who knows with these things? I don't know what the conversation was inside. Um, it should not be indicative of, I, I don't think, um, you know, the, the reluctancy of the Governor General to actually grant, uh, to grant the uh, recommendation to dissolve Parliament and issue that election call, but perhaps a friendlier conversation, uh, so lasting certainly longer than the last time the governor, uh, the prime minister was visiting the governor general, which was 37 minutes, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, now we're up to 55. He will come out uh, of that uh, building there uh, and address Canadians for the first time uh, during this campaign as the liberal leader. And things will get going. Uh, of course, there'll be questions about why, but it's happening. Uh, and uh, this will be Justin Trudeau's first chance to speak to Canadians about why he feels now is the right time to seek a renewed mandate for his Liberal Party. And with that, the Liberal leader, Justin Trudeau. I want to begin today by addressing the unfolding events in Afghanistan. We've been constantly monitoring the rapidly evolving situation. And I've been briefed by officials earlier this morning to get the latest developments on the ground. As always, the safety and security of Canadian personnel is our top priority. The current situation poses serious challenges to our ability to ensure that safety and security of our mission. So as of this morning, Canadian diplomatic personnel are on their way back to Canada. We thank them for their tireless efforts to help the people of Afghanistan in their pursuit of democracy, human rights, education, health and security. Our commitment to the people of Afghanistan 
including women and girls and the LGBTQ2 communities, remains unwavering. And we will honour the sacrifices of Canadians, our armed forces, diplomats, journalists and civil society have made over the past years. Our government has also committed to resettling up to 20,000 Afghans through the ongoing Special Immigration Measures Program. Our ongoing work to bring Afghans to safety in Canada under SIMS remains a top priority, and we will continue to work in close collaboration with partners and allies on this commitment. Ministers Garno, Sajjan and Mendicino will be continuing this work throughout the coming weeks. Canada firmly condemns the escalating violence, and we are heartbroken at the situation the Afghan people find themselves in today. This is especially so given the sacrifices of Canadians who believed and continue to believe in the future of Afghanistan. We will continue to work with allies and the international community to ensure that those efforts were not in vain. We are committed to Afghanistan and to the Afghan people. Thank you for joining us here at Rideau Hall today. A few minutes ago, I had a discussion with Her Excellency, the Governor General, and she accepted my request to dissolve Parliament. Canadians will therefore, therefore go to the polls on September 20th. My friends, it's been a big couple of years. The last 17 months have been like nothing we've ever experienced. And we're all wondering what the next 17 months, not to mention the next 17 years, will hold. A global pandemic, a global recession, a global climate crisis that's causing wildfires and flooding around the world. You're probably wondering what this means for you, for your job, for your kids, for your retirement, for your community, and for your country. Well, that's fair. But just look at what Canadians did in this time of crisis, in this time of uncertainty. When this pandemic struck, Canadians dug deep. You put on your mask to keep your neighbours safe. You followed public health rules, stayed home, and supported our frontline workers. And you rolled up your sleeves to lead the world on vaccinations. No one expected this crisis, but time and time again, community after community, you showed what metal we're made of as Canadians. So don't stop now. If you haven't already, go get vaccinated. And if you have, talk to the person you know who still needs to get their shot. They won't necessarily be easy conversations, but they're important to have. We owe it to each other. Because with our actions, we show what it means to be Canadian. And now, more than ever, that matters. Look, COVID-19 wasn't something we expected as a government, either. But just like you, we knew that staying true to who we are and what we believe in was the only path forward. So from day one, we focused on having your back. Because that's what we stood for. Because that's what we've always stood for. That's why we came to Ottawa in the first place, to build a government that would stand up for the middle class and people working hard to join it. That was the real change we delivered over the first six years. In fact, the very first thing we did was to raise taxes on the wealthiest 1% so we could lower them for the middle class. It's the real change we delivered by lifting hundreds of thousands of kids out of poverty with the Canada Child ben Benefit. Real change by delivering clean drinking water to thousands of Indigenous people in over 100 communities. By building and refurbishing almost 200 schools so far so that tens of thousands of Indigenous kids have a better chance. 
It's a real change we delivered by pushing hard so that everywhere in the country there is a price on pollution and then standing firm so that in no province is it free to pollute anymore. And those are the values that drove us to deliver the CERB and the wage subsidy to make sure that Canadians could get through this crisis too. On a choisi d'être là pour les familles we decided et les to be there for families and workers with the CERB and the wage subsidy. We supported small businesses with loans and help with their rent. And what we knew in 2015 and what is even clearer now is that our future depends on you. And we are still there fighting for you. We've had your back. And now it's time to hear your voice. The decisions your government makes right now will define the future your kids and grandkids grow up in. So in this pivotal, consequential moment, who wouldn't want a say? Who wouldn't want their chance to help decide where our country goes from here? Canadians need to choose how we finish the fight against COVID-19 and build back better, from getting the job done on vaccines to having people's backs all the way to and through the end of this crisis. For example, as a government, we chose to make sure that federal public servants and everyone boarding a train or a plane be vaccinated. Not everyone agrees. Not every political party agrees. Well, Canadians should be able to weigh in on that and on so much more. We believe that a government's most important responsibility is to keep Canadians safe and thriving, and that's what we'll continue to do. We were there for you, and now it is up to you to choose. It is up to you to express your views. The decisions that your government makes now will define the future that your children and grandchildren grow up in. We are going through historic times, and you must have your say. You will have an opportunity to decide on the future for this country, whether it is to continue our vaccination efforts or continue to provide support to people till the end of this pandemic. Canadians will all have to decide how we'll finish the fight against COVID-19 and how we can build back better. For example, as a government, we decided to ensure that federal public servants and everyone taking a train or a plane will be vaccinated. Everyone does not agree with that, and not all political parties agree either. So Canadians should be able to weigh in on these issues. And we believe that the most important responsibility of a government is to ensure that Canadians can thrive and live safely. And that is exactly what we will continue to do. I don't accept any party saying we shouldn't do everything we can to keep people safe and to end this pandemic and rebuild. And I certainly don't accept any politician saying you shouldn't have your choice on how to do that or on what comes next. Because as much as we've done over the past many, many months, we've got a lot of work ahead of us. We think families looking for childcare should get that now. We think workers deserve good middle-class jobs now. We think more ambition on climate change is needed now. That's what we think. So what do you think? You deserve a say because this is your moment. It is uh, now the time to wait even more for a safe and healthy Canada. It is uh, now that, that, that we must be more ambitious on climate change and work even harder towards reconciliation, to be bolder in protecting our environment and growing our economy. And friends, that is the choice that you have to make in this election. To elders in long-term care homes and people who've worked hard for a good retirement but are struggling, I hear you when you say you deserve better. We're ready to make sure you get it. 
to parents thinking about how it just keeps getting more expensive to raise a family, to young people worried about how to afford a home. You're right. It is tough. Indeed, it's unacceptable. So we're going to continue investing in housing, and we're going to keep making life more affordable. To students raising your voices on the climate crisis, yes, I'm right there with you. This is a crisis. And yes, we're banning single-use plastics, and yes, we've won the fight for a price on pollution right across this country, but yes, that's not enough. Our planet and our future are at stake. So I need you alongside me in this fight, because together we can do so much more than we can apart. And to kids, you've missed birthdays and school days. This pandemic has hit you hard, and you stepped up to help your moms and dads, to help your community. And now we need to step up to make sure that you're safe, to make sure we're building you the best possible future. Real solutions to the real problems we face. A better, stronger Canada for everyone. That is your future to choose. And this is your time to choose it. In this important moment, maybe the most important since 19, 1945, and certainly in most of our lifetimes, who thinks Canadians shouldn't have a say? After making it through 17 months of nothing like we've ever experienced, Canadians deserve to choose what the next 17 months, what the next 17 years and beyond will look like. And I know that we have the right plan, the right team, and the proven leadership to meet that moment. So to the other parties, please explain why you don't think Canadians should have the choice, why you don't think that this is a pivotal moment. Because I'm focused on our real plan. I'm focused on the path forward with Canadians. So to Canadians, I'm asking you to vote for real, progressive leadership, for strong health care, for affordable homes, for a clean and protected environment. Make your voice heard, have your say, and together, let's move forward for everyone. I'm asking you to support a progressive and ambitious government, a strong health care system, affordable housing, a protected environment. Make your voice heard, and let's move forward together. I want to thank the members of the media for being here now, and I'm ready to take your questions. Uh, good morning, sir. Tonda McCharles, Toronto Star. Uh, you didn't use the word majority, but I know you would like a majority to enact that plan. Uh, however, the NDP says you have the confidence of Parliament. They'd support you in um, any of these measures that you talk about and all of these ambitions. So how can you justify to Canadians the need for an election that will cost $500 million in the middle of a fourth wave when you said to Canadians you would not go to the polls before the end of the pandemic? This is a really important moment in Canada's history. For the past two years, for the past 17 months specifically of the pandemic, we've been making really big, really consequential decisions. And in the last election, nobody was talking about what we might do in a pandemic. So the government and indeed parliament needs an opportunity to get a mandate from Canadians to hear from Canadians on how to end this pandemic, how to build back better in really meaningful ways. As Canadians know, this is a moment where we're going to be taking decisions that will last not just for the coming months, but for the coming decades. And Canadians deserve their say. That's exactly what we're going to give them. I think everyone understands that we are really at a pivotal moment in the history of our country. 
the last few years and the last 17 months have uh, led to huge decisions being made by the Parliament of Canada and the government, not only to get us through the pandemic, but also to lay the foundations of a fairer, stronger, and more prosperous country for all by rebuilding the economy. And I think it's important that Canadians make their voice heard as to how they want to end this pandemic and how we're going to build back better now. We're at a time where Canadians are increasingly vaccinated, but we're not through this pandemic yet, and how we're going to end it involves the choices and decisions being made by Canadians about the months and the decades to come. What do you say to people who think that in gambling like this in the middle of a public health crisis, that if you don't get a majority, you should resign your political futures at stake? Will you resign? I think Canadians know that our democracy is strong. I think Canadians know uh, that we are coming through this pandemic, that it's not over yet, and people need to continue uh, to step up and get vaccinated to keep themselves and their loved ones safe. And that's certainly something I'm going to keep reminding people about every single day over the coming weeks, that people need to continue to do their part, protect their communities, protect each other, protect our kids who can't yet get vaccinated because they're under 12. I think this is a moment uh, where Canadians can and should be able to weigh in on what we're going through and on how we're going to build a society that is stronger and better and learns from uh, the challenges we've all experienced and the sacrifices we've all made uh, through the worst of this pandemic. The pandemic is not over and we're going to be taking consequential decisions on how we finish with this pandemic. And I think it's Canadians' right to weigh in on that. Next question. Good morning, Prime Minister. Ashley Burke, CBC News. Sorry, Mr. Trudeau. Um, during the last sitting of Parliament, you managed to survive the throne speech. You managed to, get, managed to get your budget passed, as well as get legislation through. Can you tell Canadians what your thinking is, why you need to have an election now in order to continue to govern, and provide some concrete examples of what you feel the, the opposition has prevented you from accomplishing? I think all Canadians get that this is a historic moment we are living through. Government and indeed Parliament has enacted significant measures to support Canadians through an unprecedented crisis. And we've done it in a way that met the urgency and the intensity of what we all went through over the past many, many months. But we're at a moment now when many, many Canadians are vaccinated, many more are continuing to get vaccinated, where I think it's right for Canadians to be able to pronounce themselves on where we're going, on how we get through this, on what the next steps are for fighting the pandemic as we face a fourth wave, but also what the next steps are for rebuilding our communities, our society, our country, so that it is better and more resilient for years to come. Canadians need to have their say. Nobody asked anyone how they thought we should manage a pandemic in the 2019 election. And together, Parliament and indeed Canadians have done incredibly well. We are leading the world on vaccinations. We've stepped up to protect our loved ones and Canadians are continuing to step up. But it's time we had a national conversation, a national direction on those next steps. And that's exactly what we're going to be able to do over the next six weeks. Following up? Or however many weeks there are. Can you also explain to Canadians who are tuning in why you are calling this election now when there are thousands of people in Afghanistan who you've promised to help who are in, in a severe danger of being captured or killed? And, and you're doing this on a day when you've just announced that the embassy is closing. Again, um, we are extremely concerned about the situation in Afghanistan, and I can assure you uh, that officials and indeed ministers 
continue and will continue to weigh in on protecting Canadians, getting Canadians uh, safely out of Afghanistan, and continuing to step up, as Canada has so many times around the world, to bring people to safety. We will be accepting in 20,000 Afghans into Canada, and that means once again, as Canadians have so many times, they get to step up and welcome people into their homes, into their communities, who are fleeing horrific violence, building a better life for themselves, for their families, and through that work, building a better life for all Canadians. It's something that we've done. It's something we're going to continue to do. And our democracy and our democratic institutions are strong enough to be able to ensure that even as we do this important work for Afghanistan, we're able to check in and make sure that Canadians have their voice on the extraordinarily pressing issues facing them here in this country right now and for the coming years. We remain extremely concerned about the situation in Afghanistan. For years now, Canada has uh, been committed to improving the fate and the future of the people of, of Afghanistan. And it is with great sadness that we see the events unfolding in Afghanistan right now. I can assure you that our diplomats, our officials and our ministers and myself I have just received a briefing, in fact, on the current situation on the ground uh, this morning. And we will continue to do the important work that needs to be done to bring all Canadians back to Canada and also ensure that we can bring in 20,000 Afghans and their families in the coming months. But our democracy is robust enough and our systems are strong enough that as we do that, we can also give all Canadians a chance to express their views on how we should continue our work and how we should put an end to this pandemic as a country and rebuild better for the coming years and decades, because this is a pivotal moment in the history of our country. Good morning, Prime Minister Marika Walsh with The Globe and Mail. Can you please clarify what the government will still do for the former interpreters and other embassy staff who are Afghans, who are still in Afghanistan? Will those people still be brought back to Canada and how? The security situation on the ground is uh, extremely uh, fast evolving. Uh, we are uh, in close contact with our allies, uh, with the Americans who have uh, increased their pre troop presence on the ground to secure uh, the airport and the green zone in Afghanistan, in, in around Kabul. Uh, we will continue uh, to work uh, to get as many uh, Afghan interpreters and their families out as quickly as possible, as long as the security uh, situation holds. And we will continue to work over the coming months. Uh, to resettle refugees uh, who uh, will flee Afghanistan, who will look uh, to come to start new lives in Canada. Uh, we've talked about 20,000 of them, and that's uh, something that we're able to do because Canadians will once again open their homes, their communities, and their hearts to people fleeing from violence uh, in far-off parts of the world. At the same time, I want to take a moment uh, to thank all the members of the Canadian Armed Forces, past and present. Uh, those who uh, fought so incredibly bravely and saw uh, fellow CAF members fall by the wayside and for our years of engagement in Afghanistan, but also those who are on the ground right now, continuing to work to support the people who've supported Canadians in our time there, continue to be there as we speak, working to get as many people out to safety as possible. Our Canadian Armed Forces do an extraordinary job in stepping up, in being there to promote Canadian values, to s help people around the world. And today, like every day, they re deserve our recognition and thanks. Following up. 
our reporters, uh, not just with The Globe, but from many media outlets, are being flooded with calls from former interpreters and their family in tears, fearing for their life. Meantime, the embassy in Canada is, has been evacuated, and your government says they're on their way home. So how will you bring these people home, and when will that happen? We continue to work to process and support uh, people seeking to flee Afghanistan and come to Canada in safety. Obviously, uh, the uh, security situation is extremely concerning on the ground, and the protection of uh, Canadians and our armed forces are top of mind. But we continue to do the work on uh, allowing and enabling uh, people who've been there for Canadians, whether it's interpreters or drivers or security or whatever, uh, to make sure that they're coming to safety. There are also human rights activists and uh, civil society leaders, uh, journalists uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, community leaders who we are working with to try and make sure uh, that we are offering them uh, the safety and the future that they deserve. Good morning, Raymond Fillion. Mr. Trudeau, a lot of Canadians may be wondering whether it's really responsible for the leader of the government to, to go on the road for five weeks when the crisis is not over and the fourth wave is beginning. Do you think it's responsible? Well, I think it's extremely important to give Canadians at this pivotal moment a choice as to how we will continue to fight this pandemic. As you say, it's not over yet. But at a time when the vast majority of Canadians are vaccinated and others continue to be vaccinated, I can say that in at every point in this campaign, every single day, I will continue to encourage and ask Canadians who are not vaccinated yet to do so. But I also think that it's important that when we're at a time where the choices we make as a parliament and as a government will have a direct uh, impact on the lives of people during this crisis and also for years to come, I think the important thing to do is to allow Canadians to make a choice and to make their voice heard as to how we're going to continue to get through this pandemic, a pandemic that no one was talking about the last time there was an election. In 2019, we didn't know that this was going to come. And I think as Canadians right across this country, we did an extraordinary job when it comes to vaccination and having each other's backs. But at the same time, I think that Canadians should have an opportunity uh, to have their say about the coming months and about how to end the pandemic and how to re rebuild better. Why not wait a few more months until the crisis is over? And coming back to my colleague's question, if you do not secure the majority you're seeking, will you resign? Well, I think it's important to point out that we are actually in a better situation as a country because of the efforts made by Canadians. Our health care workers, our frontline workers who did an amazing job helping us get through this pandemic and keep us safe. And also Canadians who made huge sacrifices by staying home and by helping each other, and especially by getting vaccinated. At, a, at record numbers, we lead the planet in terms of vaccination. We are having barbecues now, we're going to the supermarket. Life is starting to return a little bit more to normal, but uh, even with this fourth wave. So I think people understand that our democracy and our institutions are strong enough that we can continue to operate even in difficult times, and particularly at a difficult moment where the decisions made by Parliament and by the government will have a huge impact on people's lives in the months to come and years to come. So I think Can Canadians have to have their voice. Catherine Lévesque, I'm going to ask the question for the third time. If you receive a minority after this exercise, will you resign? 
we are at a time where Canadians deserve to make their voice heard and to make a choice about the next steps in this process of fighting the pandemic and also about how we're going to build back better. In recent years, I have talked about my values, my point of view as to how we can build back better. I have shown that I have the team we need, the plan we need to improve the lives of millions of Canadians who are worried, but who also understand that uh, we're at a time where the choices we make are critical. Canadians will now have a time, a chance to uh, have their say about uh, uh, how we've done and about my commitment. And I will continue to be there to support Canadians, as I've said right from the outset, as long as it takes, with everything it takes. Well, you didn't really answer my question. But in 2019, you decided to start your campaign in BC. Now you are starting your campaign in Quebec. And I'm just wondering just how important Quebec will be in this election and whether you think you will be able to secure a majority thanks to Quebec ridings. Well, in the last campaign, I started out in British Columbia. Uh, at home, and I will be at home as well this afternoon in uh, Quebec. In fact, I'm at home everywhere in this country. And it, what it matters is not necessarily what we do every day, but uh, our, our ability to talk to Canadians, because it's an important choice they have to make this time as to how we continue to fight the pandemic, how we can build back better. And in every part of this country, there will be different concerns. And I think that this election is really an opportunity to clearly hear from Canadians about their concerns and their thoughts. Obviously, Quebec will be important for me as a Quebecer, but the entire country is important because it's together, together that we have come through this pandemic. We worked with the premiers of the provinces in an unprecedented manner. We collaborated on major issues, whether it was child care, fighting the pandemic, support for small business, or uh, fighting climate change. We've always been there to work with all Canadians right across the country, and we will continue to be. You've had a lot of announcements in the last couple of weeks, even this morning, new child care agreements, long-term care agreements with provinces. You're insisting that you need an election to go to the people to get a mandate, but you're doing all of these things. You didn't wait for an election. So if you can do all of those things without an election, why do you need a mandate f further? This is about giving Canadians an opportunity to weigh in at a really pivotal time. Yes, you talk about the child care agreements that we've signed with uh, eight different provinces and territories and are going to ensure that millions upon millions of Canadians have access to affordable child care. Well, this is something that we talked about in the 2019 election. We talked about it again in the uh, 2021 budget, and we're moving forward on that. But there are many things in regards to ending this pandemic, in regards to building back better, that we didn't talk about two years ago in the 2019 election, that I think Canadians have a right to weigh in on. We've seen situations where uh, Conservative backbenchers have referred to some of this government's decisions as tyrannical in terms of how we're uh, make, creating mandates for vaccination of public servants or vaccination of people on trains and airplanes. Well, the answer to tyranny is to have an election. And I think people who disagree uh, with this government or disagree with this direction uh, should have an opportunity to make themselves heard. And that's what this election is all about. It's allowing Canadians to weigh in. It's allowing Canadians to be heard, allowing Canadians to, in this moment where we are uh, so strongly vaccinated and looking towards the future, not just the end of this pandemic, but how we build back better, looking for an opportunity to make sure the decisions being taken in Parliament and by government are reflected, uh, reflective of the hopes and dreams of Canadians. 
I'm also curious, with the fourth wave in Canada clearly uh, underway and there's risks of having a pandemic election, what do you think those biggest risks are and is that worth it to you? I think obviously uh, with the rise in numbers, uh, uh, in case numbers amongst the unvaccinated, uh, that does represent a risk. And that's why it's going to be so important that we continue, all parties, to encourage uh, everyone across this country to continue to get vaccinated. If you haven't gotten your first dose yet, get your, your first dose. If you're waiting for your second dose, book it now. We need to make sure that as many Canadians as possible are protected against this disease. Because there are Canadians, kids under 12, uh, immunocompromised Canadians who for medical reasons can't get protected, who are going to be relying on everyone else who can get vaccinated to get vaccinated to keep them safe. My kids uh, have to get tested and show vaccinations uh, before they go to summer camp, the older ones. We're expecting kids to be vaccinated in many different situations and they're stepping up for that. I think it's the least adults can do to step up and get vaccinated to protect those kids who can't get vaccinated yet. And that's the message we're going to keep pushing out there, that people need to continue to get vaccinated. And we're going to keep moving forward on measures that both encourage people to get vaccinated, but also make it more difficult for unvaccinated people to spread the disease to others. This is an important principle that this government is taking. And it's certainly something that, amongst others, Canadians have a right to weigh in on, and that's what this election will be about. Thank you. We'll take one last question. Bonjour, Julianne Lapointe de Radio Canada. Radio Canada. Vous dites Mr. Trudeau, entendre le choix. You say that you want to hear what Canadians' choice is, but uh, for many, the choice is clear. They don't want an election. And what do you think or say to Canadians who feel betrayed uh, by the government's decision to spend this money on election? Well, the fact is we're not in normal times. We're in the middle of a pandemic, a crisis, and we are reflecting on how we can rebu rebuild our society better. And we have a government and a parliament that for 17 months have made huge decisions that will have many different impacts on the lives of Canadians for years to come. So I think we are now at a time where Canadians deserve to have their say, to express their views, to express their choice as to how we're going to put an end to this pandemic and come through this once and for all, how we're going to do in the coming years, how we're going to build back better. That's what democracy is all about. It gives Canadians a chance to make their voice heard and to choose the direction that their government and parliament will take. And therefore, Canadians will now and should have a chance uh, to make their voice heard in this election about the pandemic and the future. I know that there are millions of Canadians right across the country who want to be heard, who want to have a say about the decisions we're making, about the choices we will be making in the months and the years to come. And this election is their opportunity to do precisely that. A new government doesn't necessarily mean uh, a period of adju adjustment, I suppose. Uh, but how do you think it will be possible to quickly put the machine uh, back and get it working again, uh, considering the, gover the country has been hit very hard in this pandemic? Well, the government will continue to work hard to protect Canadians, uh, just as it did during this pandemic, and we're going to continue to do whatever work is required uh, on Afghanistan, on Haiti, where once again, they are facing a terrible event that we all find heartbreaking. The government and our partners, the provinces, will work together to keep Canadians safe in the week coming weeks. And of course, we will be enthusiastically welcoming new members of Parliament to Parliament that Canadians send there to be their representatives uh, 
And uh, I know that Canadians' ability uh, to choose what mandate they're going to give the government or what plan they would like to see go forward on the future of this country, to choose who will be in that parliament and who will be making extremely important decisions on their behalf, important decisions in the history of this country. Well, I think it's a pivotal moment for all Canadians, and I look forward to presenting our vision and uh, sharing my optimism with all Canadians about the future of this country. I think one of the things we know is that even while there's an election going on, the work of our government continues, whether it's dealing with Afghanistan or dealing with the heartbreak of yet another uh, terrible earthquake in Haiti whether it's uh, continuing to do the necessary work to keep Canadians safe through this pandemic and work uh, with our partners across all the provinces who are themselves working very hard on dealing with this fourth wave amongst unvaccinated people. Our institutions are strong. The opportunity we have right now for Canadians to make themselves heard and to send, in many cases, new representatives to Ottawa to be their voices voices for their communities in Ottawa, to be able to have their choices resonate, not just through the end of this pandemic, but into the coming years and decades as we build back better. This is a moment in which Canadians deserve to have their voices heard. Canadians deserve to make their choices. And like I said, I'll leave it for the others to explain why they don't think Canadians should get to weigh in in this extraordinarily consequential historic moment. Merci beaucoup. C'est ce qui m'a fait la conférence de presse d'aujourd'hui. This is what answered his presser. Merci tout le monde. All right. And that is the Liberal leader, Justin Trudeau, on this first day of the election campaign, Campaign 44, after meeting with the Governor-General, Mary Simon, who signed uh, the, the declaration uh, allowing for Parliament to be dissolved and allowing for this campaign to officially be undertaken. Now, behind me, you're going to see, that's Mary Simon signing um, signing the, uh, the declaration there. Behind me, you're going to see a very quick exodus of reporters and uh, technical uh, people working uh, for the campaign, all heading now out to uh, Liberal headquarters where they will depart uh, this afternoon uh, for Montreal. Um, but the Prime Minister there, that was his, the Liberal leader, rather. He, of course, remains the Prime Minister, but we call him the Liberal leader throughout the campaign. It'll just take a couple hours for that to get, to get programmed into my brain. The Liberal leader making the case there to Canadians about why this is the time for an election, saying that it is a, a critical time in this country's history after an incredibly unprecedented 17 months, and it is up to Canadians now to, as he said, make their voices heard, to decide what kind of country they want going forward and whose ideas um, should be used in order to you know, direct the country in, in the direction that Canadians see fit. Uh, it was obviously a question that he was well prepared for and ready to take. We'll have to see how, how all of you, how Canadians respond to the argument he made. Lots of questions, too, on, uh, on Afghanistan, as uh, the uh, Taliban has now taken control of most of the country, including now seizing control of the presidential palace. And the president, uh, President Ghani, has now fled Afghanistan. And then some comments, too, on, on Haiti, where there are now reports of more than 700 people dead uh, due to the earthquake that occurred yesterday. But let's go back to the politics of, of what was said here uh, and the argument that the prime minister presented to Canadians and to the official opposition as well about why this is happening today on August 15th. Ashley Burke is here at Rita Hall, as is David Cochran. They are both uh, just about to take off uh, with the uh, Liberal leader, but we'll get their take first on, on what we heard there. Um, Ashley, it was, it was, as I said, a, a question the Prime Minister expected, and he really did try to make a compelling argument uh, to Canadians about why this needs to happen now. It's not just that he wants it, it's that it is up to Canadians to have their say. We also heard him ask three times if he would resign, if he does not get the majority government that he's seeking. And same messaging you, you said there, he really stuck to uh, what he prepared to say, which is that Canadians uh, need to have their, their voices heard right now, that they need to weigh on 
weigh in on the future moving forward. Um, and that this is a, a what he called a historic or pivotal time. But also there was some very important news off the top of this press conference today about what's going on in Afghanistan, that the embassy there is closing, that diplomatic workers are headed back to Canada starting today. That is news that Afghan interpreters and their families on the ground sitting in safe houses waiting right now for the government's help are going to be very upset to hear. The people I've been talking to say that this was what they feared the most, that once the embassy is closed, they worry they will not be able to get out of Afghanistan. And uh, Trudeau was asked questions about why he would call this elect or trigger this election today on the same day the embassy is closing. Um, you know, he's mentioned that the, the situation on the ground is escalating quickly. As you noted, the Taliban is really closing in on Kabul. And uh, he said that they, they will continue to get Afghans out of the country as long as possible until it's not safe to do so. Yeah, and I, I should say that I, I don't think there would be anything that would prevent uh, the public service uh, from from continuing with those efforts to uh, get ref, uh, refugees out of Afghanistan, um, and and that in a caretaker provision, I believe that's something that the government could also do. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously that is sort of the news story of the day. But uh, I only have about a minute here before Mr. O'Toole pops up. All party leaders will now be responding to the Liberal leader. Uh, David, just quickly your take on what you heard. He tried to answer the question about why now with the making it not about now, but what is about next. Yeah. We had your back, now we want to hear your voice. So, and then challenge the other parties to explain why Canadians yeah. shouldn't have a choice and what comes next for this country, because things are very different from the last election. That's the political argument. But the Afghanistan situation, Rosie, you're right, the caretaker mode can continue, but with the embassy closed and the plane's gone and the interpreter's still there and the aid worker's still there and the refugees yeah. still there, this is a type of issue that requires almost hourly ministerial oversight. And I wonder how Minister Sajj and Minister Mendicino and Minister Garneau are going to do that while they're campaigning. This is, yeah. this is a, a real potential risk for them, uh, strictly on a humanitarian level but on a political level. Because if it goes bad in Afghanistan and it looks like we've abandoned the people by doing this, that, that we have tried to help, uh, that could go south really quickly yeah, uh, for them I, in a campaign. Yeah, and again, uh, as I joked off the top, he, he, the Liberal leader obviously remains Prime Minister, so can continue to get uh, security briefings, can continue to speak to allies about uh, what next steps are to help people uh, be removed, and certainly the fact that they did make that promise uh, will help them. Okay, this is the Conservative leader, Aaron O'Toole, now responding. Let's listen live. For all of us. Across the country, Families have lost loved ones before their time. Hardworking Canadians have lost their jobs and have seen the cost of living skyrocket. We're finally at a point, thanks to the efforts of all Canadians who've stayed at home, got tested, got vaccinated, where we can see our loved ones, our friends, and our families again. We shouldn't be risking that for political games or political gain. The last year was difficult for everyone. Right across this country, families lost loved ones, workers lost their jobs, and prices continued to rise. Canadians made a huge effort. During the pandemic, you stayed home, you got tested, and you got vaccinated. That bore fruit because now we are in a position to see our loved ones again, our friends and our families as well. But we shouldn't be risking all those efforts for political games or political gain. ...about the best interests of Canadians would be straining every sinew to secure the recovery right now. Instead, Justin Trudeau has called an election. That's Justin Trudeau's choice. And I hope that his decision doesn't cost Canadians too dearly. My wife Rebecca and I had COVID-19. We know the fears and uncertainties that are out there. But let's be clear. This election is not about the next week, the next month, or even the next year. It's about the next four years. It's about who will deliver the economic recovery Canada needs it's about who will take action to protect Canadians from spiraling living costs, from rising taxes, from poorer services. For the past six years, we've been promised solutions, and year after year after year, Justin Trudeau has let the Canadian people down. 
The result? Hard-pressed families struggling to pay bills and worried about the cost of food, of housing, of heating. And the Liberal Party's answer? To ask you to reward them with another four years of majority government for doing the bare minimum. Another four years of broken promises and of letting Canadians down. And the NDP, Greens and Bloc Québécois, they support spending other people's money as much as the Liberals. They're all the same. Depuis six ans, on nous promet des solutions. For six solutions. years now, we've been promised solutions, and yet year after year, Justin Trudeau isn't there for Canadians. And what's the result? Stressed out families struggling to pay their bills. People who are worried about the price of food or housing or heating. And what is the Liberal Party's response? They are asking you to reward it with another four years. Another four years of making false promises of doing the bare minimum and letting Canadians down. And the Bloc, the NDP, the Greens? Well, like the Liberals, they just want to spend your money. They're all the same. Business as usual isn't enough. Canadians need more. Canada needs more. We need a strong economy to support high wages for workers and great infrastructure. We need a strong economy so that today's Canadians can have confidence that tomorrow will be brighter for the next generation. Canadians deserve to know what their politicians will deliver. They deserve to know that there's a plan and they deserve a government that will keep its word. Twelve years in the military have taught me to always have a plan. Canada's recovery plan will unite our country and secure the future. I am a new Conservative leader with a proven track record and a fresh approach. It's Canada's recovery plan to get our economy firing on all cylinders and to get our public finances under control. It's our plan to secure one million jobs, tough new anti-corruption laws, mental health action, securing Canadian-made medical supplies, balancing the budget. The 12 years I spent in the military taught me that you always have to have a plan. And that's what we're going to do with Canada's recovery plan. That plan will help us uh, to recharge our economy and uh, to get our public finances under control. It is our plan of action. One million jobs, a new anti-corruption law, and mental health action. Canadian-made medical supplies, a balanced budget, and solutions to the labour shortage is Justin Trudeau's entitled government borrowing $424 million a day, racking up $1.4 trillion of debt that he's going to ask you and your children to pay back. We can't afford more of the same. We can't afford more borrowing and higher costs of living while Justin hands out contracts to his friends. Conservatives will stand up for hard-working Canadians and their families. We'll work for you, not a small group of people in Ottawa who help themselves, lobbyists, donors and friends of the Liberal Party. We'll work relentlessly to make sure that for generations to come, Canadians can grow up with world-class services, a healthy economy and healthy finances. Canada is a country where politicians must earn trust not one where you're born into power and can take it for granted. Our team is ready to get to work, to earn your vote, and then deliver that plan. The election is about the future, and the choice is this. Who do you trust to secure your economic future? There are five parties, but two choices. Canada's Conservatives, or more of the same. Vote for a strong economy. Vote for Canada's recovery plan. Vote to secure the future. Vote Conservative. Who do you trust to secure your economic future? There are five parties, but just two choices. 
Canada's Conservatives on the one hand, or more scandals, more spending and more debt on the other. Vote for a strong economy. Vote for Canada's recovery plan. Vote for the future. Vote Conservative. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Andrew Lawton, True North. You've been very vocal in pushing for transparency with regard to the uh, National Microbiology Lab uh, security leak. We've heard stories of Chinese infiltration of Canadian institutions, of influence campaigns against uh, politicians. How big a threat do you think uh, Chinese regime infiltration is? And if elected, what would you do to counter that? Justin Trudeau has been offside with respect to communist China for six years. And our citizens, the two Michaels, are approaching a thousand days in prison. It's been the Conservative Party that's been standing up, like Canadian governments of the past, for human rights, for our dignity, whether our motion with respect to the Uyghur minority population and the genocide, with respect to banning Huawei from our critical 5G infrastructure. Mr. Trudeau is completely offside with our values as a country and our allies. And the risks to our economy, to our public safety, are real. So Canadians need to know a Conservative government will never sacrifice your security, the well-being of our country, and our values at home and abroad. In September, you pledged to balance the budget within 10 years. More recently, we've heard projections from the Parliamentary Budget Officer that we could be running deficits until 2070 for 50 years. Do you think that balancing in 10 years is still feasible? And if so, what would that course correction from an O'Toole government look like? It looks like Canada's recovery plan, our five-point plan to secure the future. We will get the budget back to balance over the course of the next decade our fifth pillar, because our first pillar is going to get people working in all sectors of the economy and in all regions of the country. We're the only party that supports people getting back to work in the energy, the softwood lumber, steel, aluminum, our fabricators. We value small businesses and, and we'll have very detailed programs to help those in hospitality, tourism, hanging on by a thread. We will have the economy surging in the right direction for all Canadians, and that will allow us to balance the budget over the course of the next decade by helping people get back to work in all parts of this country. Simon Lefranc for uh, Le Droit. Um, Le Droit. Good morning, Mr. O'Toole. Today, the Conservative Party, Party's position on mandatory vaccination of uh, federal civil servants. What is your position? Thank you for that question. Vaccines are very important. They are effective and safe. And I am encouraging all Canadians and all Quebecers to get vaccinated. My wife, Rebecca, and I contracted COVID-19, and that's why we uh, provided information about our vaccination. It's very important for our economic recovery and to allow us to fight the fourth wave. I support strengthened measures such as masking in order and showing negative tests against COVID-19, as well as rapid testing for those individuals who have not yet become vaccinated. These are precautions that are reasonable and should be taken. Justin Trudeau has once again abandoned Canada. His election in the middle of the fourth wave is another example that he's failed. Vaccines are safe and secure for use. They're a critical tool in fighting COVID-19. That's why Conservatives have been pushing for a year to get a stable supply of vaccines early. That's why my wife and I, Rebecca and I, had COVID-19. And we know vaccines are critical, why we videoed our, our vaccination process. We must work together to fight COVID-19. And I support enhanced measures such as masking, showing a negative test, and rapid testing for those who are unvaccinated. Those are reasonable precautions that we can all use to fight together against COVID-19. Mr. Trudeau 
is launching an election in the fourth wave of a pandemic, not securing the health and economic well-being of Canadians after he let the Delta variant into this country. This is a time for us to work together for the well-being of all Canadians. <clears throat> Thank you for that answer. Now, with respect to vaccination or mandatory vaccination of federal civil servants, what exactly is your position on that? As I said, vaccines are effective and safe, and I encourage all Canadians and Quebecers to get vaccinated. This is an important tool with the others, such as vaccine uh, and rapid testing. And Conservatives would like Canadians to be able to make their own decision. We have to educate people, not force them. And so we have to work together against this fourth wave of COVID-19. And that's why we have a plan, the fourth pillar of our plan, to provide a good recovery for Canada, uh, more domestically made medical supplies that will allow us to be better prepared in future against uh, a pandemic. Hannah Thibodeau from CBC National News. Hope you're doing well. I, I want to ask you more on vaccines, please. Uh, when it comes to mandatory vaccines, uh, Tr Mr. Trudeau says it should be mandatory for federal workers, for people who are on planes or trains. You have said get your vaccine, but you don't believe in mandatory vaccines. He says this will be a part of the decision that Canadians will make on which party believes in this. But also, I want to ask you, sir. Do you believe in a vaccine passport for people who have been vaccinated to have access to certain events or venues because they have gone out there to get their vaccines? Thank you, Hannah. As, as you know, my wife, Rebecca, and I publicized our vaccination process to show Canadians directly that vaccines are not only safe and effective, they're the critical tool in turning the page in COVID-19. We have to try and encourage and have as many people as vaccinated as possible and then take reasonable precautions to use other tools to keep all Canadians safe. As I said, using rapid testing, using screening, using masking, all of the tools that Canadians have learned to, to live with in the last 15 months, we have to, to use to fight COVID-19. And the federal government should respect and partner with any of the provinces on their approaches to keep Canadians safe as well. Some provinces will use a pa passport, a vaccine passport, other provinces will use a a combination of measures to fight against the spread. I'm very disappointed, honestly, that Mr. Trudeau calling an election amidst a fourth wave of a pandemic is trying to confuse and divide people with respect to their health care decisions. I will always work in close cooperation with the provinces on health uh, to secure the health and well-being of Canadians and Quebecers. We have to work together. And I will always respect uh, the decisions made in Quebec, such as a uh, vaccine passport and other uh, tools that are used across the country because we need to work together. And I'm disappointed by Mr. Trudeau's approach in the middle of a fourth wave to trigger an election and divide Canadians on the question of their own health. I think we need to educate people and not force them to do things. And we have the needed tools to fight against a fourth wave. Do you believe in vaccine passports yourself? And then just to clarify my first question. And then second, will all of your candidates be vaccinated? As I've said, and it's critical for Canadians to hear this, vaccines are safe and effective for use, and I encourage all Canadians to get vaccinated and to ask questions if they have any questions about the process. That's why I've been very public. My wife and I got vaccines and did it on video because we all have to work together. We also have to work to use the other tools that are there as well. And there can be reasonable accommodations using masking, using rapid testing, using screening, to make sure we keep people safe. It's time for us to work together, and I can assure you, the Conservative Party, all of our team members, all of our candidates, will be working hard to try and work with public health leaders to follow health advice and to keep Canadians safe amidst an election being caused, called for no reason 
other than political gain by Mr. Trudeau. He knows there's a fourth wave. He has all of the briefings. He has more information than all Canadians. And I sincerely hope Justin Trudeau is not putting people at risk by launching this election. Next question. Abigail Beeman, Global News. Uh, Mr. O'Toole, I'd like to ask you about the Charlie and the Chocolate Factory video on Twitter. I'm wondering how much of a setback it is for you to have a number of caucus members uh, criticize a party video on the eve of an election, and if unity is something you'll have to be working on in, in this campaign. Conservatives are united. We don't think we should be having an election in a fourth wave, but we do see the division caused by Mr. Trudeau, the flight of jobs and investment in our country. Our country's never been so divided, and we're going to present a serious plan. Canada's recovery plan, our five-pillar plan to kickstart an economic recovery. Our team is united about getting Canada back to work and making sure we're never again unprepared for a crisis as we have been over the last 15 months. I'd also like to ask you, now that you have been a Conservative leader for a year and you talked about getting Canadians to know you better, and there are still Canadians who, who don't know you very well, I'm wondering what you're going to do to change that in, in what's going to be a tight uh, time frame in this campaign. Well, I've been the COVID leader in a year, but I'm really proud of our team and I'm really proud of our efforts to connect with Canadians on Zoom and through all means, and we'll be doing that later today. I'll be talking to thousands of Canadians later today, as I have as Leader of the Opposition. Canada needs a plan. It's been a tough year for everyone, including my family, all Canadian families. Our five-point Canada's recovery plan will address everything from jobs to accountability, trust in government, issues under Mr. Trudeau's cycle of scandals, national mental health leadership, an issue that's been important to me since I left the military, making sure we're ready and making sure we get our finances under control. I know that Canadians are worried about the future and as they get to know me, I bring people together, I deliver, and we have a plan to secure the future. I'd like to come back to my CBC colleague's question. Do you, uh, will all your candidates be vaccinated, Mr. O'Toole? All our candidates will be working very hard on the ground and will follow all the health protocols. As I've said, vaccines are very important. They are a critical tool in fighting COVID-19. And for our team, yes, we will be working very hard to ensure that all health measures are respected right across the country. You didn't really answer my question, but I'd like to move on to something else. The Pride Challenge today. Now, you are the leader of the Conservative Party, and you said you would take part in those events. So what kind of message does it send to see you not participating today? Well, I am currently preparing for an election, of course, but I have a clear record on rights, on the rights of the LGBTQ community. I'm an ally, and I will be working with that community on their well-being and the protection of their rights. And I will participate in events such as the Pride event in future, because as a member of parliament, I have already participated in the past in such events in my own riding. Mr. O'Toole, I'm a little confused here. You, you say that Justin Trudeau is putting people at risk by forcing us into an election campaign. And yet, you won't require your own candidates, who are going to be directly interfacing with the public, with voters, to be vaccinated. Why not? Well, Glenn, Mr. Trudeau's made a decision to launch an election in the fourth wave of pandemic. There's no reason for this election. And in fact, we've asked him not to. But as Canadians have seen over six years, Mr. Trudeau will always put his own self-interest, interest of insiders, ahead of the national interest. And he's doing that again. I hope there's no risk. I'm disappointed in his decision. Our team, from myself right through to all of our candidates, will follow public health guidance and make sure we're part of the fight against the fourth wave. It has been a tough 15 months for our country. That's why we have a plan to get our country back to work, Canada's recovery plan. And as we communicate that, Glenn, we're going to be making sure we follow all public health guidance to keep people safe. 
You've been traveling the country over past months. You were at the Calgary Stampede, for example. Uh, and now, with a very short election ca campaign starting, you were spending the first part of it, the first day and possibly all day tomorrow, in a hotel ballroom in Ottawa, nowhere near voters. Does that not look performative, that you're trying to emphasize the idea of virtual campaigning when you haven't been virtually campaigning before? And, and what's the reason why you're stuck here in the Ottawa bubble and not getting out and meeting people? What's been great in the last month and a half, Glenn, is I've been finally able, as the opposition leader, to get out there. The Calgary Stampede, the, the, the greatest outdoor show on earth, was amazing. I've, I've met people and, and saw the risks of the fires in British Columbia. I met with folks in the offshore industry in Newfoundland and Labrador who have been under attack, have been completely neglected by, by Mr. Trudeau. I've met with small business owners in all parts of the country, in person, wearing masks, following measures. Today, using some of the innovations we've learned over the last year, I will be speaking to thousands of Canadians directly in Quebec, in British Columbia, and in some other provinces as well. So we're going to have exciting opportunities to get out and, and see people on the ground, hear about their concerns, talk about Canada's recovery plan. But we also are going to use some of the technology that allows us to connect directly and be accountable to Canadians. On va utiliser tous les outils. We will be using every possible tool in this election, including technology. And we have had great visits on the ground with people across the country. Yesterday, I was in Lévis with my daughter Molly for the candidacy of Dominique Vien, who is going to be a strong candidate for the National Capital Region. And today, we will be speaking to thousands of Quebecers and we'll talk about Canada's recovery plan virtually and on the ground in the regions of Quebec and right across the country. Bailey, Globe and Mail. Uh, Mr. O'Toole, uh, what specifically as Prime Minister would you have done or would you be doing to deal with the ongoing crisis in Afghanistan and the uh, events of today? Well, these are very sad events today in Afghanistan. And my, my heart goes out to the thousands of military families across the country who in the last few weeks have, have really been suffering because we lost people in that country. Um, and for many of our veterans, uh, it's horrible to see the Taliban once again securing control of the country. I, my heart is also breaking for the women and, and young girls there. Um, that's why Canada was there, our longest mission. And to think they're, they're going to be subjected to those um, horrific conditions. So Canada must work with our allies. And we're going to be standing up for dignity and for human rights as a government because Mr. Trudeau has not. And today I'm, I'm really thinking about our, our military families. This is a very difficult time for them. On doit, mes pensées sont avec les, les familles militaires à travers le pays. Parce... That the issue in this campaign and the issue when it comes to mandatory... ...en Afghanistan pour les droits humains, pour les, les femmes et les filles là-bas. Et c'est un temps difficile pour nos familles militaires. Uh, uh, et on doit travailler en étroite collaboration avec nos alliés pour, pour aider et euh, je vais être là comme premier ministre pour nos valeurs, et pour nos alliés et pour les droits humains à, à travers le monde. As a follow-up, in March, you said the Conservative Party needed to have the courage to change in order to have a more positive result than it's had recently. Um, there was pushback then on climate change. Do you think your party, can you seriously say, has your party changed as you go into this election? We have the courage to put our country first with a plan to get the country working in all parts of the country and in all sectors of our economy. And our party has put forward some incredible ideas that Canadians will be getting to know more details on in the next few months. We are the only option that want to get people working, want to help the small businesses that have been hardest hit to restore accountability and trust in not only the Prime Minister's office, with three personal ethical investigations, the sexual misconduct allegation cover-up in the military for three years, people are losing faith. We have a plan to restore that. We have a plan to show leadership on mental health, on preparedness, 
and get our finances under control. So there's courage in the plan we're presenting. And I invite Canadians. I am a new leader with a new style. And I'm in this for you and your families. And my entire adult life, I've served Canada. And now I'm asking for your trust to secure our future. This will be the last question. Hi, Mr. O'Toole. Chris Reynolds, Canadian Press. I haven't heard you speak directly to several questions around vaccination and your own conservative candidates. I'm wondering, again, will you be requiring candidates in the Conservative Party to be vaccinated, or will you even be asking them to get vaccinated? Chris, as I've said, vaccines are a critical tool. They're safe and effective, and Conservatives for the last year, as you know, have been demanding vaccine supply and access and encouraging Canadians to get vaccinated. Um, I think we can also have an approach that uses a whole suite of health measures from rapid testing and screening, mask usage, to have reasonable accommodations uh, for people that may not be vaccinated, whether young children or, or, or other people. We have to use all of the tools and not divide Canadians. Let's work together to fight the fourth wave. I don't think we should be having an election in a fourth wave, but public officials should be talking about all of the measures we've learned in the last few years. All families have a collection of masks at home. Let's use them. Let's use all of our tools. Let's talk about vaccines, rapid tests, distancing, mask usage to fight COVID-19 together. This morning, Justin Trudeau said that Canadians have a, a right to weigh in, a right to have their voices heard and, and vote in an election. Uh, should the Prime Minister resign if he is reduced, or sorry, if he stays at a minority government status? Canadians deserve the right to have a government that will be ready for a crisis. Canadians deserve to have the right for a government that puts their interests ahead of the interests of lobbyists and insiders and friends of Mr. Trudeau and his, and his family. Canadians have a right to a plan and to a team that will deliver what we're promising Canadians. So I'm going to be presenting Canada's recovery plan. I have a track record of bringing people together from my time in the military, my time in the private sector as a volunteer, I'm in this for my children and your children. And so Canadians have a right to see the options. There may be five parties, but there's only two choices. Canada's Conservatives, or more of the same from the Liberals and their, the other parties. This we all for today. Merci. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Okay, and that is uh, the Conservative Party leader, Aaron O'Toole, taking questions on this first day of the campaign, saying that this election is about political opportunity, that he doesn't want it right now, that having an election during a fourth wave is dangerous. But he also refused to say uh, that he would get any of his, make sure his candidates are all vaccinated. Uh, he says that that is a choice people should make, that his job is to educate people and to use all public health tools, uh, including vaccination and others. We are now going to Montreal to join in progress the Bloc Québécois leader Yves-François Blanchet who is speaking to reporters. Let's listen in live. Ce n'est pas une élection sur la sortie, la sortie de pandémie. pandémie. C'est une élection pandemic. This is an election about a prime minister who refuses the mandate of the voters given him back in 2019 because that mandate required of him as he was forced to do, and as the opposition parties agreed to do, to negotiate and to agree to improve legislation. In other words, uh, by other means than his own will. A prime minister who wants a majority. When Quebecers made it quite clear that they do not want a liberal majority in the House of Commons. And there is even a risk uh, for the gains made in recent years in, by Quebec uh, in Mr. Trudeau seeking a majority. What will happen uh, with the improvements that the Bloc made to the Canadian uh, Broadcasting Act with respect to the use of French? What will happen to supply management in free trade with the UK? or? 
uh, the United States, uh, uh, where uh, there has been no compensation provided yet. And what will happen with the necessary energy transition and the need to stop increasing the production of hydrocarbons in Canada? What will happen? with this uh, uh, momentum uh, with respect to Quebec being a nation and people being able to speak their own official language. What will happen, as we saw quickly at the end of the session, uh, with the progress made with respect to the French fact when Parliament was leaving for the summer and the Prime Minister appointed a, a person who's probably very interesting but who did not have among her qualifications the essential ability to speak French. What will happen with the uh, challenges supported by the federal government with respect to uh, the Quebec legislation? And what will happen with the increase in transfers, health transfers, that all the provinces are asking for? And where there has been very much pressure exerted on the federal government in that area. What will happen with the seniors that uh, the federal government won't support? And ultimately, we will never be able to get around one fundamental issue, a campaign, an electric campaign with the Bloc Québécois uh, will always be about the emergence of a purely Quebec economic nationalism. It will always be a campaign focused on French. It will always be a campaign uh, focused on ensuring gender equality. It will always be a campaign focused on real uh, freedom of expression in every sector of society and ultimately one focused on freedom per se. It will be a campaign that will allow us to strongly assert who we are and we are the Bloc. The Bloc Québécois. Thank you. Okay, and that is Yves-François Blanchet, the uh, leader of the Bloc Québécois, kicking off his campaign in Montreal today, saying he too does not believe that this is an election uh, that is needed and indeed that it could be a risk for Quebec because it would end up perhaps with a government uh, not as favourable as the Liberal Party. So a little, a little mixed messaging there. Uh, before we get to the NDP leader, Jagmeet Singh, also in Montreal, let's bring in at issue for some initial thoughts on what we've heard. Chantal Hébert, Andrew Coyne, Althea Raj, and also My Party Lines podcast cast co-host Elamine Abdul Mahmoud is here. I'm going to do a quick go round before uh, Mr. Singh pops up. Uh, I'll start with you this time, Andrew, on, on what you made of the Prime Minister's um, attempt to, to explain to Canadians why this election is needed now, basically saying to Canadians, you have a voice, we need to hear from you about the direction of this country going forward. Well, he made a pretty compelling case for having elections. Uh, I don't think he did quite so well at saying why we have to, why 17 months is the magic number. Uh, he mentioned, for example, that this election was like the 1945 election after World War II. By his logic, we should have had that election in 1944. We should have had it before the war was over rather than after. <laughs> and I think he, he frankly didn't do a very good job. But, you know, he had a strategic imperative that he has to go to an election now for his election reasons. He knew he wasn't going to be able to really wriggle out of this. It was going to be a bad day for him. But on balance, he thinks it's worth it. What do you think, Chantal? Especially at one moment, he actually said, um, it's up to the opposition parties to now explain why Canadians shouldn't have the right to have their voice heard, trying to turn it on, on everybody else. That uh, is probably the, I'm not saying it's a great argument, but probably the best spin that uh, he could possibly put on calling an election. Uh, saying, you know, that the rationale, it's, it's time that you give us an assessment of how we did and where we go from here in extraordinary circumstances. Uh, I suspect that uh, most uh, voters will not be terribly impressed by that rationale, but they will not be terribly insulted by it either, and that's probably what uh, mm -hmm, the mm -hmm. Prime Minister, the Liberal leader, was looking for, a... a, a not lose lose uh, proposition, something that will make people say, okay, I don't agree, but I'm not offended. Uh, so I think that the liberals on a, a larger uh, scale, what today has demonstrated is the perils of uh, having an election launched that 
for strategic reasons is he do not control outside events. And I don't think they have the fall of Kabul to the Taliban's on the day that they start an election campaign. Yeah. I think that, regardless of the fact that there's a caretaker government, the, the scenes that we yeah. may be getting to see over the next two, three weeks, fairly or unfairly, Justin Trudeau is the prime minister, and it's, they stand to make his election campaign and his decision to go into one look like a re near responsible yeah. distraction. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think I, that's an, uh, an excellent point, as always, both of you making good points, but that elections, even with all your own calculation around timing and risk, often become about events um, that, that you can't control, as, as David Cochran said earlier, and this is one of them. Uh, I mean, we see the U.S. administration struggling to figure out what they can do. There is this promise to get 20,000 Afghans uh, into Canada, whether they be in third countries or not. NATO has just said that they spoke to um, both the UK Prime Minister and our Foreign Affairs Minister, and there is an intent by NATO and allies to at least secure the airport in Kabul so people can get out. But th this will be a challenge, Althea, uh, for, for the government in a different way than it will be for everyone else in these early days. I would point out that Aaron O'Toole didn't even mention Afghanistan until he was asked about it. I don't think it's the idea that things that you can't control. They obviously had, um, you know, things land on your lap that you may not have um, assumed that that were going to happen so early. But in this case, it speaks to competency. It is, you know, I think the opposition will likely try to make, the opposition now, the other political parties, will likely try to make the case yes. that more could have been done to save the interpreters and the people who helped Canadian forces during the years that led up to this point. Um, the, you know, they had uh, lots of announcements in the last week about all the work that they plan to do to bring these people here. But this was work that could have been done a year ago, two years ago, three years ago, and that wasn't necessarily done. And so I think that that speaks to the competency of the current government. Why do you want uh, an extended promotion, if you wish, if you can't even do the job that we've assigned you to do? I think that's, that's the vulnerability on that point. I think what was interesting to me from the press conference was the Liberals have tried to uh, make this election post-pandemic, basically the arguments they would have liked to make last fall, uh, you know, if they had gone on the throne speech, but obviously the party wasn't ready then and the staffers that they needed to prepare the election were busy actually responding to the crisis. Um, but one of those things, I think, that that the echo of the 2015 campaign the Liberals were trying to make, that kind of uh, nation-building, we're all in this together, um, it kind of got sidetracked yep. with the Prime Minister really throwing a wedge issue in there, which is mandatory vaccination, which he's tried to squeeze the NDP yes. and the Conservatives on. And I think the impression that's left with me from the two leaders' first comments was that Aaron O'Toole, knowing that this issue was coming, um, and the fact that most people don't actually know who he is yet and he has a chance to frame himself, it may be framing himself as somebody yeah. who is actually offside with where most Canadians tell pollster they are when it yeah. comes to mandatory vaccines. Okay, yep. I, 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 yeah, I will say I thought that the answer there, it was, it was surprising, it was such a struggle. I got to put everybody on pause for a couple minutes. I'm sorry, Elamine, you'll start when we come back. Here's the NDP leader Jagmeet Singh now holding his first press conference here on day one in Montreal. Let's listen in. Bonjour et merci beaucoup. Je veux commencer en reconnaissant la tragédie en Haïti. by recognizing the tragedy that has occurred in Haiti. I'm so sad to see what has happened and we must help them. I also want to take a moment to talk about what's going on in Afghanistan. It is very, very troubling what's going on. We're seeing the reality of Kabul falling and I'm really worried about the women particularly, but the people that served with and helped out Canadian forces, I'm deeply troubled. We need to make sure we are doing everything possible to help out and to evacuate uh, those that are in danger now. In general, it's been difficult times. The pandemic hit us hard, and we know that workers were facing major challenges. And uh, because of these challenges, it was a difficult time. And during this difficult time, we knew that there were other crises occurring, the climate crisis. We know that there are forest fires occurring that were created because of this climate crisis. There's also a housing crisis that continues, a crisis that was tough before, before the pandemic, 
but is even worse now. And we also know uh, that uh, there are new realities in our health care system that need to be addressed. These gotten worse over the past six years. When we think about the climate crisis, Justin Trudeau is the only leader of a G7 nation who has increased emissions over the six years he's been in power. And we know that the climate crisis is so devastating. We are feeling the impacts of it right now with forest fires across Canada, making it hard to breathe, making it hard to see the sky. This is a real challenge that we're up against, and it's only getting worse. We know that the housing crisis was a crisis before the pandemic. It's only gotten worse over these six years. It's becoming more and more unaffordable for people across the country to find a place that's in their budget to rent or to own. And we know that Indigenous people continue to face serious struggles, not having access to clean drinking water, being denied basic human rights. All these things have only gotten worse over the past six years. And despite things getting worse, we see Justin Trudeau right now focused on an election. We are still in a pandemic. We are still worried about this pandemic. And people have referred to the pandemic and said, well, we've all been in the same boat. And I say really clearly, we've not been in the same, we've not, we've not been in the same boat. We've been in the same storm for sure, but some people have ridden out this storm in luxury yachts while others have been in leaky lifeboats. We know that the ultra rich in this pandemic have been given a free ride by liberals and conservatives, so they have increased their wealth. The richest billionaires in Canada have increased their wealth by $75 billion in counting, and Justin Trudeau's allowed that to happen. Companies like Amazon make record profits, but still contribute virtually no taxes in Canada. Instead of calling an election, Justin Trudeau should be focused on these crises, on getting people the help they need, on walking the path instead of walking away from these commitments. So many people are wondering why this selfish summer election. Well, it's clear Justin Trudeau wants to grab power, wants a majority. But why does he want a majority? It's certainly not because he wants to help more people or help people more, it's only because he wants to help people less and people end up paying the price. The reality is he is fed up with New Democrats pushing him to deliver more help to more people and he certainly doesn't want to put in place any measures to make the ultra-rich pay their fair share. I believe that better is possible. Si on ose ensemble, je sais qu'on peut investir. If we dare to do better, then we can invest in our future. We can invest to resolve the housing crisis. We can invest in health care. We can respond to those issues affecting the indigenous communities and give them justice. If we work together, just imagine what we can achieve. And that's exactly what we want to do. Let's dare to be better together. Let's invest in people. And let's ensure that the ultra-rich pay their fair share. And let's better build a better society together. And I'm ready for any questions you might have. Encore un grand merci à toute mon équipe qui Again, sont ici. thanks to my entire team for being here, and I'm ready for your questions. Merci. Merci, Jagmeet. On va commencer avec les questions euh, sur l'endroit. On va passer à Jean-Sébastien Cloutier de Radio-Canada. Bonjour, Monsieur Singh. Good afternoon, Mr. Singh. Now, I'm sure you heard Mr. Trudeau's speech that said that we are at a unique time in our history and that it is now time to ask Canadians how or what direction they want Canada to take, what kind of recovery they want. Do you agree that this is the right time to ask Canadians to make a choice? Well, it is a good question, but if we look at what people have already said that they want, people, I'll just wait one second. Canadians and people right across the country have said that they want to ensure that the ultra-rich pay their fair share. Did Mr. Trudeau hear people saying that? They have said that the indigenous communities must have access to clean water. Has he listened to that? 
They have said that we need to do more to address the climate crisis. Has Justin Trudeau been listening to people? Did he hear that? So, and I could continue. We have a number of examples of people asking for certain things, but Justin Trudeau was not there listening to people. He didn't hear what they were asking for. So the real question is, why should people now trust Justin Trudeau to listen to what they're asking for if, after six years, he's been ignoring all of those demands? And a sub-question, your election platform is basically well known. Many of the things that were in there two years ago are in there and now. Mr. Boulouris behind you was the only member of parliament or the only elected candidate here. And I'm just wondering how you will adjust uh, uh, your uh, message to please Quebecers and appeal to them so that it will make a difference for the NDP and not for the Liberals even though that we're seen with the $10 a day child care, that's a major incentive on the left. So why vote for the NDP? Well, with New Democrats, we never take people's votes for granted. We work very hard to win their trust. And what we did during this pandemic for people right across the country and here in Quebec, it was in fact New Democrats who pushed and forced the government to deliver more help to more people. We now have a record. The Liberal government wanted to begin the CERB at $1,000, and we forced the government to double it. And by doing that, almost 2 million more Quebecers received that help, the help they needed. With the wage subsidy, the Liberals under Justin Trudeau started at 10 percent. With 10 percent, obviously that was not enough to help people. And we forced the government to increase the amount to bring it up to 75 percent. And in so doing, we saved thousands of jobs. We have already shown with clear evidence that new Democrats are people who are working for you, who are fighting for you and your families. And we showed this with concrete evidence. We also showed that the other opposition parties have done absolutely nothing to improve people's lives during these difficult times. One of the greatest challenges that we have faced in a generation. But we were there for people, and we know that in future, people will need us. So if you vote for a new Democrat, you will be voting for someone who will fight for you, who will force the government to do what it needs to do to help you and your families. And in the recovery, that is especially important to have allies who defend your interests and the interests of ordinary question, Canadians. Next question, Olivia Stefanovic from CBC News. Hi, Mr. Singh. You've called this a selfish election, but I'm wondering what you would say to Canadians who do feel like they want to have a say in this post-pandemic recovery, and what is your vision? Why is your vision any different or stronger? I'll start with the vision. Uh, we, we know that the Canadians are worried about what happens next. It's a very genuine and real worry. People are up against a lot of challenges. They're worried about what happens next. And we've seen governments do one of two things coming out of an economic crisis. There is a clear playbook that previous Conservatives and Liberals have used, and that's either cutting the help that people need, which I'll remind folks Justin Trudeau is already doing right now. He is cutting, he has already cut the help that people who can't go back to re work receive by cutting the CRB by $800 a month. He's also clawing back the GIS from seniors who needed to access CERB. So he's already clawing back and cutting help to people who need it most. The other option is to put the burden back on the people that have already suffered or already struggled by increasing taxes on workers, on small businesses. We are the only party saying very clearly there is a third option, which is to make the ultra-rich pay their fair share. Companies like Amazon, which make record profits in this pandemic, do pay virtually no taxes in Canada. We can stop that. We can make sure they pay their fair share and invest that back in people. Everyday workers pay their fair share. So should wealthy corporations, so should the richest billionaires. Just because you're a billionaire shouldn't mean that you get to hide your wealth. And that's one of the things that we bring to the table, that we're going to make them pay their fair share and invest that into health care, into housing, into justice for Indigenous people. And um, in terms of people having their say, well, Justin Trudeau talks about people having their say. People have had their say. They've demanded very clearly that the ultra-rich should pay their fair share. Justin Trudeau teamed up with the, with the Conservatives to vote against our, our motion to make that happen. People made it really clear they want Pharmacare. 
Justin Trudeau teamed up with Aaron O'Toole and the Conservatives to vote against a universal pharmacare that would help all Canadians. So Justin Trudeau has shown again and again, I can go on, that you know, people demanded clean drinking water. That's what people wanted in this, in this very important time. Again, he didn't listen to what people asked for. So what gives people any confidence? Right now, people are wondering, well, if he didn't listen to us when we asked for all these important things, why should we believe that he's going to deliver what we asked for now? If he wants to do what people are asking for, let's go back to Ottawa and do it. There's no reason why we can't. You're starting your campaign in Quebec, where your party has lost a lot of seats. You only have one seat right now in this province, and you also only have one seat in Atlantic Canada. So I'm wondering what your message is to voters in eastern Canada, and if you can't make any, any more growth or any more gains in the next election, what that says about your party's future in this part of the country. Well, I want folks to know when times were tough, we were in this pandemic and it was hard on a lot of people and, and workers were wondering and uncertain about what was going to happen next. We were there for them. We were there for people and we fought for you and your families. It was New Democrats that delivered the help that people needed and counted on. Millions of people kept their jobs because we were there to fight to increase the wage subsidy. We brought in a paid sick leave that never existed at the federal level. We made that happen and we stood up for people. And so everyone across Canada benefited from New Democrats being in Ottawa. And I say to folks, imagine how much more we could do with more New Democrats elected. The people that I met recently in Atlanta, Canada, would benefit from New Democrats fighting for them and their families to give them the help they need. We saw that in this pandemic, no other opposition party could point to a single victory that they fought for and won to make people's lives better. They did not benefit from having those other MPs representing them. New Democrats were there for them. And that, that's what I put to them, our track record and how another four years of Justin Trudeau saying a lot of great things but not delivering them is not going to help people. It's going to hurt people. And that we have the only plan that says that the ultra-rich should pay their fair share to invest in people. Prochaine question, Virginie Anne de la Presse canadienne. Presse canadienne. Montreal yesterday, we saw thousands of protesters uh, taking down the street uh, against COVID-19 sanitary measure. Um, a lot of comments that were emerging was their mistrust towards politics, science, and the government. And I'm curious to see uh, what would you uh, say about your plan on rebuilding the trust with Quebecers and Canadians? I think it's so important that people have trust in the decisions we make. And so one of the most important things we can do is to give transparency, clear evidence, clear reasons why people need to follow public health measures. The more transparency, the more evidence, the more examples we can give of why it's important, I think is really, is really helpful. Uh, we actually have a great candidate, Nima Mashouf, who is a uh, someone who's an expert in virology, who understands uh, diseases, who can help build that, that type of confidence. But I want to thank everyone who's taken the vaccine. It is so important that we follow these public health measures because we are all really connected. If we do everything possible to take care of each other, we will get past this pandemic and we can build a better Canada. But to do that, we need more transparency and clarity, more information shared. A lot of people have genuine questions and we can answer those and provide more information. And I'm confident Canadians, Quebecers, everyone wants to do their part. If we can provide them with that transparency, they will. And Annie Bergeron Oliver from CTV News. Hi, you talked in your opening remarks about how the situation in Afghanistan is troubling. Um, we're hearing that there may be thousands of Afghans with ties to Canada who believe that they're stranded, that they won't be able to get out. I'm wondering two things. One, what would you have done differently if you were leader during this crisis? And two, how are you going to make sure that this issue remains on the forefront of the top burner, despite the fact that we're in the middle of a campaign? Thank you. I really appreciate the question. First off, I wouldn't be calling an election. There are a number of crises that, that we're faced with right now. There's a, you know, the earthquake in Haiti where we need to be doing our part to help out. There's a, a really large Haitian population here in, in Montreal that's deeply concerned and worried about what's happening. And uh, in Afghanistan, this is a serious crisis. These are people that are at risk. Many of them are those that served with Canadian forces, provided help and support, translation services. There are Canadian supporters. These are allies that we need to be doing everything possible to help. So I wouldn't have called an election. I would be deploying all resources possible to get those uh, that are at risk out of Afghanistan, provide them with help to evacuate not only the people directly impacted, but their families as well. We've played a really important role around the world, and there's been many sacrifices made in Afghanistan, and a lot of people on the ground who need our help right now, and, and I would focus on that. And how we can continue in this campaign is I'm gonna raise this up, raise this issue and let Justin Trudeau know. Uh, let uh, the government know that there's 
so much more that we can do right now and we should be doing to help these, these allies out. And you've also said that it's dangerous to be holding an election during a pandemic, but you did go and help Premier Horgan campaign in British Columbia in 2020. So what's different now? Well, a couple of things. Whenever an election is called, I will always be there to help out people and to show folks that there is there is a strong option with New Democrats to fight for you. Uh, right now, what we're up against uh, with with Justin Trudeau calling this election is w what is the reason for it? You know, we've got two years left on our mandate, and it's clear that in calling this election, he's walking away from a lot of things that could be done. You know, today is pride. And there are a lot of things that we could continue to move forward on that Justin Trudeau promised that he would bring in. He promised that he would put an end to the blood ban. Well, he's walking away from that commitment because once we go to election, all the work towards that goal is, is going to be restarted. The conversion therapy ban that we wanted to push forward, more work needs to be done there. He's walking away from that. Really, it begs the question, why have this election right now if he wants to do the work that he claims he wants to do, we have shown again and again, if it's help for Canadians, we are there. And we've delivered that help. We have fought to get more help. But if it's to hurt Canadians, we've seen Justin Trudeau team up there in O'Toole to force the port workers here in Montreal back to work, to vote against Pharmacare, to vote against taxing the ultra-rich. So we've seen that Justin Trudeau can make this problem work if it's to hurt people and we've been able to force him to help people. Why is he having this election when none of those things require an election? We will now go to questions on Zoom. If you have a question, please use the raise your hand function. Si vous avez une question, utilisez la fonction levez la main. That concludes our event. Thank you. Merci. Merci. Thanks so much for being here. Merci. Merci. Okay, that is MVP leader Jagmeet Singh in Montreal on the first day of his campaign. Obviously, the focus there as well. Why this election now? Uh, Jagmeet Singh repeating a line he's used over the past number of weeks, calling this a, quote, selfish election, uh, and that it's clear that the only way Justin Trudeau wants to help people is if he's pushed to do so. That is, of course, part of the NDP's positioning through this election, that the reason uh, people got increased benefits during the pandemic and other things was because the NDP managed to get the government to uh, come around and make some compromises. In turn, the NDP uh, supported the government at various moments throughout, um, uh, throughout uh, the last sitting of Parliament. Let me bring in at issue for some of their thoughts on what we've heard so far. Andrew, Chantel, Althea, and uh, my Party Alliance co-host, Elamine abdul Mahmoud. And because he didn't get a turn to talk the last time, uh, he can start us off on, on where things are. And you can talk about uh, Mr. Singh there, or if you'd rather just go back to what you've heard generally so far, Elamine, and, and what stood out for you. I actually want to go back to something that uh, Justin Trudeau said earlier on, which is in talking about the mandating vaccines in travel, uh, he started talking about saying, look, this is something that we want to do, and uh, not every party agrees. And uh, in one yeah. pointed part of his presser, he said, um, you know, other parties have accused us of tyranny, and the answer to tyranny is to have an election. So he clearly yes. wants that fight. He yes. wants this election to be yeah. about the vaccines. And, and so far, it seems like the opposition is kind of willing to give that to him. I'm, so I'm interested in how that develops, because the idea that uh, being accused of tyranny, the answer to that is immediately an election. I don't think everyone agrees, but I think it's an interesting tack to take on. Yeah, I mean, let's go back to that, because that is where we left off as we wait for Green Party leader Annamie Paul to uh, to come out. Uh, maybe I'll go to um, Chantal on this. I, I, I was surprised that Aaron O'Toole, and perhaps I shouldn't be, that, that the answer he had was, you know, people will make their decisions, we'll educate them, but we should be using all Paul public health tools at our disposal, at our disposal, rather. I mean, the best way to fight the virus, I, I think this is indisputable, is to be vaccinated. Um, but Aaron O'Toole can't seem to say, or doesn't want to say, or for reasons of, of people in his party can't say uh, it should be mandatory. What, what did you make of his answers around that? Uh, that uh, they were fuzzy, that the, the fuzziness will come back to haunt him probably longer than the timing of the election will haunt Justin Trudeau, because it is a, a central uh, preoccupation. And up to a point, uh, Mr. O'Toole is setting himself up uh, for looking weak on public health measures mm -hmm. if he believes, as most of us do, that we will be going into a fourth wave over the course of the campaign that the numbers will increase. Uh, and as yeah. they increase, the Conservative Party is increasingly going to be under pressure and asked, well, 
you know, you would not even ensure that all your candidates be vaccinated. That's how soft your commitment to vaccines uh, really is. I believe that um, as that fourth wave materializes, as the kids go back to school who mm -hmm. cannot be vaccinated, yep. public opinion that is already heavily in favor of uh, vaccination passports, mandatory vaccinations yep. for some category of workers, that public opinion will harden uh, in favor of stricter yes. measures. And Aaron O'Toole yeah. today has placed this party in a, a, a net risk spot, to put it mildly. Okay, um, thanks, Chantal. I got to let everybody go. I'm sorry. Green Party leader Anna Paul is speaking. I will come back to you. Don't worry. Andrew will go first when we come back. Let's listen. 570 and four. 270. That's the number of fires that are raging right now in British Columbia. 6,000 properties have been evacuated and almost 28,000 others are on high alert. 49. 49 is the number of degrees that uh, BC experienced and the town of Lytton experienced uh, just over a month ago that left that town burned to the ground. We are experiencing the worst drought on the prairies, uh, perhaps in the history of Canada and the worst drought Canada has ever experienced if it keeps going this way for much longer. 570. 570 is the number of Canadians who died directly linked to the heat dome that settled over British Columbia. 570 Canadians who would otherwise not have died, died. And four, we are in a fourth wave. We are officially in the fourth wave of this pandemic. And for anyone who wants to tell me or the people behind me that we are out of it or it is different, um, they are wrong and they should come down to this neighborhood where we have many frontline workers, uh, where we have we had hot spots like St. Jamestown that had the highest rates of infection for much of the pandemic. They should tell my mother who is expecting her, uh, her latest grandchild in a couple of days um, and won't be able to go and be there in the hospital with my sister because of the pandemic. They should tell her that the pandemic is over. And so these are the numbers that tell the story. And there was a time that when calling an election under any of these circumstances would have been unimaginable. There was a time when any of these events would have provoked an emergency recall of parliament. Let us also take a moment to, to acknowledge as well that, Haitian, that um, the Haitian community in Canada uh, is very worried at this time. Uh, there are hundreds of Haitians uh, who died tragically in the earthquake on Saturday. Let us also take this moment to remember and to recognize that Kabul has fallen today. Kabul, where 40,000 Canadian service men and women served where a thousand and more were, were a thousand were wounded and over 159 lost their lives. Kabul has fallen. Kabul has fallen. And instead of going back to parliament on an emergency basis to ask, how will we protect the women and girls and people who remain behind? How will we ensure that all of the sacrifice that Canada and, and, and our service men and women have made was not in vain? We are headed to the polls. And then let me add one last number, 500, 500 million. 500 million is how much the last non-pandemic election costs. And let's ask ourselves what we could have done with that money and how many people we could have helped with that $500, 500 no, million dollars. And so why are we here then? After the prime minister said just in May that there would be no pandemic election, we are here because the Liberals have decided that they want all the power, that they want a majority, and they think that now is the best time to get it. They decided to trigger an election in these circumstances, these unimaginable circumstances, but that really just shows that uh, the government has uh, put the people of Canada at the bottom of its priority list. We have this election. And instead of focusing on public health, public health has lost out to partisan ambition. Here's 
what could have been accomplished in two years that are left. Because we have areas of commonality, we have areas of collaboration, we have areas of cooperation between parties, and let's stop pretending that we don't. Let's do things for people in Canada. As you can see here, each one of these policies has been passed by the respective members of the respective parties. Guaranteed livable income, universal pharmacare, long-term care reform, miss the um, respect um, and implementation of the calls for justice from the missing and murdered indigenous women and girls report and a just transition for oil and gas workers. All of these extraordinary priorities, all of these that we agree on, two years is enough time to get this done if you have the will to do it. S'il y a la volonté de le faire, if there's a will to do it, we can accomplish all of that, meet all of those goals. We have the votes, we have a mandate from our menders, and we have a mandate from Canadians as well. And so, again, common sense and collaboration has lost out to the quest for power. The thing that I believe that the backroom operators who cooked up this election uh, have uh, gotten wrong is that try as they might with their polling, try as they might um, with their calculations, they underestimate the desire of people for change. They underestimate the desire of people for change that this pandemic has provoked. And we are ready to strike out in a new direction. Their calculations and their polling results will never allow them to understand the determination of the people of Canada. They've decided that this is the best time for the Liberals to secure their majority. Ultimately, it will be up to you, the people of Canada, to decide who you send back to Ottawa to represent you. Uh, I know that many people in Canada are, uh, are, are getting to know me and will get to know me over uh, the next, uh, next while. So let me just say a few things about myself. I'm a mother, my children are here today. I'm the daughter of immigrants. My mother is here today. My father sadly died uh, in long-term care during this pandemic. I am a wife of 25 years. I am a sister. I am a social entrepreneur. I'm a former diplomat. I'm a lawyer. I'm a policy analyst. I am someone who had the great fortune of being trained uh, at Princeton University and the University of Ottawa Faculty of Law. And because of that, I am someone who loves big ideas. Uh, I also love big, doable ideas. And I am a Canadian who believes, like all of the Canadians behind me, that there is a possibility of greatness within our country and that we can be heroes, that we can be part of a generation of Canadians that will earn their place in the history books. And I'm a Canadian who believes in our possibilities, in our potential, in the greatness of this nation and our ability uh, to achieve what we try. As did all of these Greens, because that is what we believe, and that is the dare, and we believe the Green Party offers the daring ideas to get us there. Uh, in normal times, the dearth of ideas that we have seen would be a problem. But in unprecedented times, it is fatal. Our country is suffering. It needs leadership. It needs leadership that offers a positive, progressive, and compelling vision about how we will repair the social and economic damage wrought by the pandemic, how we are going to secure our future prosperity, how we are going to tackle the climate crisis and build a more resilient society that leaves us better protected. That's where we come in. <laughs> Cue the Green Party. <laughs> In my past 10 months as leader, I've emphasized that we need to seize the opportunity uh, to address three great challenges. Turbo boosting our move to a green economy, completing our social safety net, and forging a just society. The green economy represents the greatest economic opportunity of our lifetime, 
It is estimated to generate more than a trillion US per year by 2030. And Canada has the chance of a lifetime not only to definitively bend the curve on greenhouse gas emissions, but also to set ourselves up with the jobs of the future, to set ourselves up with the competitive economy of the future. It's where the jobs of the future are, it's where the smart money is going, and it's where Canada needs to become a global leader to secure our future. Alors, au lieu d'être le chef... So, rather being a world leader when it comes to greenhouse gas emissions, because it's important to recognize that at this point, Canada is one of the worst emitters of green, greenhouse uh, g gases around the world, one of the worst among rich countries, not only rich countries, but all countries of the world, and we have never been able to tackle a single target to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. We can do that, but we must need a plan, but we must have a plan. best known for its environmental focus. It is our innovative, evidence-informed social policies that have shone through during this pandemic. When I ran here in Toronto Centre in 2019, I spoke about the urgent need for guaranteed livable income. I spoke about the need for urgent long-term care reform, and I spoke about the need for decriminalization and the creation of a national safe supply to prevent the opioid deaths, related deaths that are ravaging this community. Uh, the pandemic has proved these concepts have worth, and it is very encouraging to see the cross-party cooperation and consensus uh, that is emerging around these issues. But the thing to remember is that we are always going to need those big ideas. This is where the Green Party comes in. This is the thing that sets us apart. We are always going to need to innovate. We are always going to need to look down the road. We are always going to need those people who are the fearless champions of policies that we were the first to propose, like equal marriage, reviving um, the, the call for national pharmacare or proposing, being the first to propose a carbon, shared carbon border with the United States. And so we see that people in Canada have said clearly that they do not want to go back to way, the way things were, and they are really ready to strike out on a new path. We only do this through cooperation and collaboration, and again, Look at how much we could accomplish through cooperation and collaboration if we set our minds to it. Okay, that is uh, Green Party leader Annemi Paul. She is in Toronto kicking off her campaign. Annemi Paul has run twice in the riding of Toronto Centre, lost twice, but she's hoping the third time will be the charm and that she will indeed win her own seat uh, to be the elected Green Party leader inside Parliament. Let's check in with David Thurton, who's with the Green Party leader there. Um, obviously, the theme of the day, David, is no one wants this election, uh, but uh, Annemi Paul has a lot to prove uh, with this election. and. and and give me a sense of what she's going to be doing today and tomorrow. Yeah, well, she's going to be campaigning right here in her riding of Toronto Centre, and that's all she could really do at this point in time. Because as we've been reporting throughout the last couple of months, there's a lot of turmoil, there's a lot of drama happening within the Green Party. It has distracted them from fundraising, it has distracted them from, you know, focusing on preparing for this you know, this campaign didn't come out of nowhere. It's not a surprise. People were expecting yeah. this and they haven't ha had the time to, you know, prepare for this. So, you know, she's going to be focused here in Toronto Centre because she can't really uh, go around the country and uh, afford to travel and, and do a, a large campaign. The party cannot really afford to do that. And maybe that's a good thing, perhaps, Rosemary, because she, if she doesn't win her seat, people within the party are telling me that there's no pathway forward for Anna me. She might have her supporters here. She might have uh, a lot of people that want to see, you know, the first black woman uh, or the first uh, Jewish, uh, uh, first woman Jewish leader elected to the House of Commons. She might have all those well-wishers, but, you know, it's going to be tough for her to win a seat here in Toronto Centre. This is a liberal fortress. And if she doesn't win it, well, you know, it's going to be hard for her to make the case uh, within her party that she should stay on as leader. 
Okay, David Thurton, uh, you have uh, a busy days ahead. Even if you're just going to be in Toronto, it'll still be awfully busy. Thank you so much. We'll talk to you again soon. That's uh, the CBC's yes. David Thurton covering the Green Party for us in this campaign. As he said, lots of issues there to watch for the Green Party, especially after uh, the departure of Elizabeth May, uh, who did often do uh, sort of national tours on trains and whatnot. We won't see that kind of campaign this time around. I'll bring back at issue for one more quick go round. Uh, Chantal Hebert, Andrew Coyne, Elamine mm -hmm. Abdul Mahmoud. Uh, Althea Raj had to leave us, but she will be back with us tonight on the National. Oh, she's there. She did not have to leave. She's delayed her <laughs> departure for us. She's very kind. Okay. Uh, Andrew wanted in before I had to cut you all off last time there. So, Andrew, um, hopefully you'll remember your point, and, and I'll let you go. <laughs> oh, well, just to pick up on Chantal's point about Aaron O'Toole yeah. and the, the vaccine mandate yeah. question, I agree that he looked uh, as uncomfortable on that question mm -hmm. as Justin Trudeau did on the early election call. It is their, each of their vulnerability today. I'm not so sure it's quite as central, proved to be quite as central to the election, but it's no doubt that it plays into the liberal willingness to, or, or ambition of portraying the Conservatives as being not really grounded in reality or science, and of what Aaron O'Toole mm -hmm. is being basically hostage to uh, what I might call the crazy wing of his party. Why then you, would he walk into that trap, as you say? Well, because it's worth it to him, just as it was worth it to, to Trudeau to, to take the lumps for calling the early election. Why? Because the, the, it's not just his party he's worried about, it's the People's Party of Canada, the, the, the Maxime Bernier Party. They've yeah. been pushing hard on this particular issue of vaccine <clears throat> mandates. And just as um, Aaron O'Toole likes to portray all the parties to the left as being all the same party, Maxime Bernier likes to say, yeah, and, and the Conservatives are a left-wing party as well. So he wants to keep some daylight yeah. between himself and the Liberals on this issue, and I think that's why he felt he had to do that. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a difficult... Uh, tightrope that he has to walk all the time on various issues, and this is another one. It, it was an obvious question, and I guess that's as far as the answer is going to go for now. But maybe won't be a question throughout the whole election. We'll see. Althea, I wouldn't mind you weighing in on what we heard from both Jagmeet Singh and Annami Paul in, in terms of how important this is, election is for both of them. Uh, well, for Jagmeet Singh, I think what this campaign shows is that for the past year, he has worked very hard on message discipline. The NDP has sought to have a record of vulnerability that they believe they had in 2019. And more importantly, now the party has much more money. Uh, they believed in 2019 that when his popularity started uh, to spike in the last week of the campaign, if they had had funds, they would have been able to ride the wave and perhaps win a few more seats. And this time, while they have a target list of about 16 ridings, they're really hoping, this is like the first tier of ridings they're going after, that if his popularity again spikes, that they, they have the resources and the targets and the staff to mobilize to kind of uh, really give him the momentum that they wish they would have been able to give in the last election campaign. Uh, with regards okay. to Anna uh, Paul, get the, yeah. No, just yeah, quickly. very quickly, I agree with David. <laughs> yeah. I think that... Uh, yeah. Her leadership is on the line, and uh, the problems with her party, I think we're all kind of watching this as the soap opera uh, of, the, of the summer. Um, it is unfortunate. It could be that the Green Party only ends up with Elizabeth May as their lone Green MP. Well, uh, okay, Elamine, last word to you, if you don't mind. I mean, I just have to say that one part at least was disorienting for me, watching the enemy Paul standing in front of all these green signs, as though the party isn't in chaos right now. Like that sort of felt like, like quite a bit of distance between the reality of the Green Party and um, and that image of a sort of a united party, and he, she's here to campaign, she's here to do this seriously. But I do have to say that, you know, yeah. I'm curious about where we go tomorrow. What, if, if the Liberals are able to keep the, the story of, well, why not have an election? to a one or two day story. What happens next? Because uh, the story that uh, Aaron O'Toole is bringing forward is already that pocketbook issue. Uh, saying this, he had this phrase, he said the Trudeau government has been doing the bare minimum. I'm not sure that story can stick right now. I'm not sure that story can stick um, if we are looking at a country that is more than half vaccinated and well on its way to you know getting better numbers on that front. Um, so saying that they did nothing over such a period of time where people expected yeah. a lot from government and in fact, that did deliver quite a bit of that, I think that's a risky gamble for, for Aaron O'Toole. Last word to Chantal before I wrap you guys up. Okay, just to say that uh, as of two, and I'm not totally answering the question, but uh, uh, tomorrow and the day after and the day after, the parties are basically going to be treading water until Labor Day. 
uh, because that is yes. when attention will really focus on this election campaign, frankly. Uh, and the leaders' debates will take place right away, uh, at the 8th and the 9th of September. And that's when the focus comes. So up to a point, the question of where the campaign uh, narrative goes from today until the end of the month, basically, it's going to be about treading water. OK. Uh, I'm going to leave it there, everybody. I appreciate it very much. All of you will be back with me on The National later tonight. So we'll have more time. You'll have more time to refine your smart thoughts. Uh, and we'll all talk then. Thank you so much for joining me throughout the morning. Appreciate it. Chantal, Andrew, Althea, and El Amin. See you soon. Uh, as Chantal said there, the d debate dates have been confirmed. September 8th for the French debate. And the uh, English debate will be on September 9th. So mark your calendar for when you might want to tune in to a critical moment during uh, the campaign. Denise Denizene Nakoke is uh, in Yellowknife. He's a community organizer in the Northwest Territories. He's part of the country uh, that we aren't sure all the leaders will get to during this very short campaign. So we wanted to make sure to get a voice in from, from the North. Nice, nice to see you today. I, I'm wondering what are the issues that are, are in your community that, that you want to see talked about um, that maybe won't get talked about? Uh, good day, Rosie. Uh, yeah, uh, here in the North, we are, there's a different reality once you get past the uh, NWT border into the north here. We only have one MP candidate. So uh, here in the north, you mostly vote for the person. Uh, the parties um, try to do a lot up here around campaign time, but usually kind of forget about us when they're doing their work. <laughs> But up here, <laughs> yeah. I think a lot of I think a lot of the issues have to do with the underlying issues have to do with indigenous governance, uh, and completing these modern day treaty processes up here in the north. Also, uh, yeah. another thing up here is connectivity. I know we're connected here through the internet yeah. in this way, but uh, the reality in some remote communities is that that's not the case as well. Too, uh, I've heard in some places in the high, high Arctic, it takes three hours to download one PDF document. So there's a lot of issues. Okay, Dennis A. Koke, I, I hope you'll come back. I have another show on Sundays. You can come back on that show when I have a little more time for you. But thank you for weighing in because I, I knew your voice is important and, and I wanted to hear from you. Thank you so much. Thanks for the opportunity. Have a good day. Okay, you too. Uh, do I have time to check in quickly with David? Yes. David, just tell me where you are now and, and uh, w how things are going there. You're with, traveling with the Liberal campaign this morning. Oh, look at you. Yeah, There's a bus well, behind yeah. you. That's good. Yeah, I, I, know, I know we're almost out of time. As you can see, my Uber is here, so I do have to run in just a few minutes. But, you know, I, speaking to Liberals, you know, on the shift from Rideau Hall to here, uh, there is a hope inside their campaign that the question of why are you having this election now, it's a totally unnecessary election, that that will go away before the end of the first week of the campaign, yeah. that that's a 72-hour story. The vaccination issue, though, that they've sort of wedged Aaron O'Toole with, that may be this election's yeah. values test issue. Uh, the way uh, gay marriage and abortion was last time, vaccination, the majority opinion is there. They're going to push that as hard as they can in the opening days of this campaign. Okay. David Cochran, thank you for your help from early this morning. Happy, uh, happy trails there. We'll talk many times. And thank you all for watching here on the first day of this campaign, election campaign 44. We will be with you here through the whole 36 days for all the key moments as you decide who you want to vote for. We'll give you all the information you need. I'm Rosemary Barton. Thanks so much to my whole crew and all of you for watching. Have a great day. Bye-bye.